Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome back. I hope you have enjoyed Bangkok so far. Uh, today is the, the last part of the workshop, and I think it is very important part because this will be the roundtable discussions. We will talk about uh, uh, feedback. We, we would love to have your feedback about the methodological framework uh, and, and uh, the initiative, coverage, the, the possible use of the information and what kind of support that we can be uh, offer to, to help uh, the country in, in utilizing these information and also in any other extended area on digital trade policies, capacity building to, to support our member states. And today we have uh, again, uh, my co-host from ECA, Simon Mewell, uh and uh, Fendi, and I also have uh, Ms. Natnisha. Uh, both Fendi and Natnisha helped in the Asia Pacific and uh, other regions data collection. So uh, they will share that experience. And uh, Simon also bring uh, experts and researchers from Africa who also will be sharing experience as well. We will run the, the discussions in, in two segments. First segment, we will be talking about uh, methodological framework, data collection, experience sharing, and feedback from experts and government. Uh, this will cover the Agenda item one and two, which uh, you see in the timetable. And then the second segment, we'll talking about how we could use this data, how we should expand the data collections and how we could provide technical assistance and extended partnerships in the initiative, which is the, if you see the agenda item is about the, the third and the fourth items in the timetable. So um, we will start by having Fendi to give you the summary of how we uh, capture in the methodological framework to, to uh, give you the information on logic behind, and then you can uh, provide your feedbacks to us. Simon, do you have something to add? Thank you very much, Ritada. Good morning, uh, everyone. I think you, you said it all about the two segments. Uh, in the way we are going to run it, and what we have agreed, I think, is that indeed, uh, in the first segment, Fundy is going to make a, a presentation, um, maybe around 10 minutes. And then after, we will uh, not take questions right away. Uh, we will move to the experts. Uh, maybe we will do uh, one expert from Africa, one from Asia, another one from Africa, and then another one from, from Asia, uh, so that they can share their uh, experiences in, in uh, collecting the data, the challenges that they faced. Uh, I guess there will be a lot of commonalities, but depending on the country, there may be also some, some differences. So hopefully it's not going to be too redundant. And then after, we will have uh, feedback uh, from uh, governments in uh, Asia and the Pacific and that's after this that we will open the floor for uh, questions and answers. I see we have um, participants online already, uh, which uh, which is great. And uh, and for those online, if you have any questions, raise your hand or write in the chat, uh, so that in the question and answer segment uh, we can uh, we can respond to uh, to your concern. So, Fandi, you have the floor uh, for the the presentation on the methodology. Right. Um, yeah, I think we are waiting for uh, my presentation slides, but uh, for today, uh, before we are uh, going around the table asking about the challenges of data collections for the RDT AI, I think it would be great to, you know, like to discuss the methodology for the RDT AI, and we will go to, uh, to the first slide, please. Yeah. So, so uh, the RDT AI is uh, uh, is a database that is being used to as a proxy uh, for the digital economy integrations 
in in terms of openness and harmonizations of uh, regulatory environment for digital trade and the uh, rdti uh, you know like uh, it has been uh, built for uh, countries in asia pacific and also uh, 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 africa and also latin america so the rdti covers 12 pillars and it includes 65 sub pillars under under those 12 pillars and then the idea of building these pillars uh, are based on the two uh, poles. The first pole is about uh, reducing the trade barrier costs. And then the second pole is about uh, harmonizations with the international uh, trade agreements. But uh, the RDTII is not only, uh, you know, like it's, it's, it's not comprehensive yet. And that's why like, uh, for this meeting, we are uh, expecting uh, some inputs from the member states and also other participants to, you know, like to uh, improve this uh, database because, you know, like uh, at the beginning when we start with the RDTII 1.0, we don't have these 12 pillars, we have 11 pillars. And now this database is always growing, uh, growing because, you know, like there are so many um, relevance issues related to digital trade. Next slide, please. And then the objective of the RDTII is to promote regional regulatory harmonizations. Uh, and it, it, it aims to support uh, policymakers. And then uh, by going through the, 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 the database, it will help the policymakers to find the balance between the economic and other policy objectives uh, within the country. Next slide. And for the RDTI 2.2, uh, 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 RDTI 2, we cover 21 economies in the Asia Pacific region. And you can see from the screen, uh, the 21 uh, countries uh, covered by the RDTI 2. And next slide. So how we collect data and how we build the RDTI score. So basically we work for each indicator under sub pillar and we build on, you know, like collecting the information, collecting the resources, and then we score uh, the sub pillars and then we weight each sub pillar to give a, a score for the each pillar under the RDTI for each country. And then, but for the pillar itself, we will use the equal weight to each pillar and using the average scores. Next slide. So how we are uh, scoring the sub pillars here. So the first thing that we look uh, into is whether there is a differential treatment between domestic and foreign providers regarding the measures uh, under the sub pillars. So if there is differential treatment, then there is like uh, restrictiveness measures or there is like uh, 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 dissimilar measures that we take into account the database. And the second one is whether the country introduced a measure that blocks or discourage foreign and local businesses to participate in the digital trade. So it's not like, uh, you know, like only the, dis the, the discrimination between domestic and for foreign providers, but also if there is a measure that blocks, you know, like the development of digital trade in the country, even though it applies to both domestic and foreign providers, we will also include that into the database. And then the third one is whether the country fails to adopt certain international agreements, like uh, what I present yesterday, uh, we will also include that into uh, our database. And then uh, it's, uh, I think it's very important to note two things. First, the, we are, when we are talking about trade distortive here, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a measure that covers both, not only uh, discriminations, but also, uh, you know, like uh, treatment that, you know, like reducing the effectivity, the use of uh, digital trade me relevant measures. And then when we are talking online services here, it's not only limited to the on ICT services, but also in the database, we include like financial services, business on or IT services, because you know, there are some measurements relating to the, you know, like uh, financial payment services in the database. Next slide. So this is an example for the three distortive measures. 
So uh, here uh, uh, we are talking about the the bidding requirement for public procurement, and then uh, the country requires uh, the providers to you know like to to use a specific encryption standards, and we consider this as a threat. Uh, distortive because it discourages you know the providers the service providers to join the bidding uh, for the public procurement but also the second one for example this is where you know like the bidding the, 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 there is a requirement for the nationality you know like locality of the lo uh, the nationality of the bidding requirement and it will block foreigners to participate to into such procurement and then there are some, uh, you know, like international agreements and also terms that we need to understand uh, when we go through the data collection for the database. Next. Next. Yeah. And then how we weight the sub pillars. So basically, uh, when we uh, collect the information uh, from, you know, like the national regulations or from uh, any sources that I will mention later. Then the question is uh, whether we should weight uh, each sub pillars equal. Then in, in this case, in the RDTI, we don't weight the sub, uh, each sub pillars equals because for example, if there is a country impose uh, import ban, then we cannot you know, like put uh, this kind of measures as uh, the impact of this kind of measure as big as if you know, there's a requirement just to notify or just to submit licensing requirement for importing certain uh, ICT equipment. And that's why that's, that's the, behind, the logic behind why we use like a weighted approach for each sub pillar. Next. But when it comes to the pillar, we 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 average uh, you know like we 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 average a score for uh, a, a pillars to come to like one of national score. It means that we use the equal weight to each pillar because uh, it, it will be straightforward for us to uh, you know like to compare uh, trade restricted information within the same pillar, but. But okay, again, when we compare between one pillar one and pillar two, then it will not be easy because, for example, in pillar one we have four measures and pillar two we have six measures, and then how we compare them, it will not be straightforward. Next, and then the data sources here. So the data sources that we use for uh, the database, the primary sources is the official gadget regulations and other official uh, measures and then sometimes like when we talk about to, to the researchers you know like it's not easy to really navigate to the uh, primary sources and that's why they sometimes go to you know like uh, secondary resources such as like newspapers official guidelines but we never we never use the secondary sources because they are not officials. So we just use the secondary sources, you know, like as a, as a, a, as a guidance to find the official gadgets within uh, or the relevant laws within the country uh, that we will include later into the database. Next. Now this is my last slide. Uh, uh, I will share maybe the common uh, data collection challenges uh, on uh, RDTI in RDTI. First is like when we collect the data, you know, like it's 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 sometimes very hard to differentiate between what law says and what uh, what applies uh, uh, daily in the country. And especially normally, like the researcher comes from the country, and then the, you know, like the perception that they have with you know what law says can be different and that's why like it's very important to really uh, go through the official sources and then you know like take the provisions relevant provisions to you know like to score for its uh, sub pillar here and also uh, not all countries have you know like transparency in in terms of the institutional structures so that's why it's not easy for for researchers sometimes to find which uh, ministry or which institution that we need to go through uh, to find a relevant laws uh, for uh, some measures. And then it's very tricky. And that's why uh, I highly suggest that 
normally in each country you have like law company that they are monitoring the commercial policies in the country and you can go to that kind of company first you know like just to get some of informations some of informations related to the what what relevant ministry what relevant regulations that we are need to looking for otherwise you will go through you know like so many regulations and then it will take a lot of time and especially because you need to find the most updated uh, information one and it means that you also need to make sure that uh, the law that you include in the database is not the outdated one and the other strategy is about uh, finding the hierarchy of the law sometimes you know like it's not clear in the act itself like what uh, what they are talking about these measures but when you go to the you know like further regulations such as uh, decree the decisions then you will find a detail about the implementation of the act or the law and then uh, that's another suggestions for the researcher to really understand what uh, the the country uh, implements about some measures and then in the database if we find find no measures or no regulations or laws relevant to the sub pillars what we have done if we just put an a so we don't uh, it, it means that there is a lack of uh, measures for the sub pillar here so that's uh, uh, all simons and i give a, a floor back to you thank you thank you so much fandi it was uh, it was brief i believe it was very clear uh if you have any question please hold on uh, write them that write them down uh, raise your hand in the chat we'll uh, we'll take them a bit later in the in the question and answer if i may just before we move to the uh data challenges just to say that um um so you presented the coverage for uh, for asia and the pacific in the previous sections uh, sessions of the of the workshop we also talked about uh, Africa and uh, Latin America and the Caribbean countries so we have also in the RDTI uh, 2.0 we have 28 countries from Africa uh, that are covered and we have 20 countries from uh, Latin America and the Caribbean then on the methodology just to also say that for the weight uh, and the determination of the indicators uh, they have been uh, a lot of uh, they have been extensive consultation with experts on the field. Uh, so there were webinars that were organized uh, to to review uh, each of the pillars and the uh, indicators and and sub indicators or measures uh, to uh, get confidence in terms of how we would uh, we would weight them. And then your last slide was on common data challenges, and so I think that's a good transition to what we are going to be doing now. Uh, we'll see if uh, the countries uh, seem to uh, be matching what you have highlighted or if they can bring anything new. Maybe we'll start with you, Esther. Uh, you have been covering uh, Somalia, and, uh, and so we would like you to share with us uh, the challenges that you have been facing when you cover Somalia. Not an easy country, because uh, if you recall the first session that we had, I mentioned that in Somalia, only 2% of the population is actually connected to the internet. And so obviously, uh, finding data on digital trade uh, is a challenge. And so uh, we thought it was important that you tell us uh, what you have been going through uh, collecting all the information. Thank you so much, Simon. And good morning to everyone. My name is Esther, like Simon has introduced you. I come from Uganda. My first country of research was Sudan, but it became quite complicated because of language barrier. When I went to the foreign mission of Sudan in Uganda, seeking for advice on how to go about it, I was advised to go to Makerere University for translation. And each document costs $25 and it would take me about two to three weeks to get one document translated. That was really impossible given that uh, data collection had timelines. I had to get back to ECA and we selected another country, which is Somalia. And Somalia has many challenges, especially to do with the uh, internet, there was limited online information regarding not only digital trade, but all information. You could not find information on Somalia. 
especially the laws, the acts, the regulations. The websites, the official websites, yes, are there. They talk about these laws, but there is no law. When you open, you don't find anything. You know, you could find the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Commerce and Tourism, the Ministry of Communication, Information Technology, but basically it's just a cover page. You cannot find any information. And yet, according to our mentor, Martina, for the first data set, we had to pick gov information from government sources. It made my life difficult. <laughs> the websites, yes, are there, but there is no information. So when I got back to her, she said, okay, you can try other scholars if there is a translation, but it's a must in the source column, you must put the government source then say, however, a translated link can be found on this other private source. And even these private researchers were not so accurate in certain laws. I had to use websites, international websites, like for the international labor organizations, the ITU, WIPO, that's how I was able to get the information. But Somalia itself, you couldn't hardly get the information. Maybe the information is there in hard copy form. We cannot know because I was in Uganda. When I was covering the infrastructure pillar and connectivity, it was so strange that uh, there was no information that the government of Sudan owns any telecom company, both the fixed and the mobile. Such information was not there. The only information that was there was that every telecom company was private and they had very many of them. At least they have the interconnection law, they interconnect. Other than that, there is no any other regulation that link these telecoms together. So it was quite hard, but I maneuvered until I filled up the whole data set and I presented it. Uh, in some instances, OECD could not believe. For example, I told them, there is no information on market dominance, the market shares for the telecom. They said, no, this can't be true. It can't be true. Keep searching, it can't be true. And my mentor is from Zimbabwe. I was like, Esther, try what you can. But I know this is Africa. These people in Europe, they don't know. <laughs> yeah, th there is nothing like that. Yet Somalia has about 10 telecom companies. They are both mobile and fixed. They have stayed in this country for quite many years. We can say maybe 30 or 40 years or 50 but there is no information on who takes the biggest market share. So this makes it difficult for any foreign firm wanting to enter the market to know where to start, where to begin. And most of those service providers are Somali nationals. So this is kind of a closed economy for the telecommunication sector. It's kind of a closed economy. Yeah, so those are some of the challenges. One other thing which was so unique, according to the information I got, is that uh, Somalia had not licensed any mobile or telecommunication, either fixed or landline. They had not licensed until 2020. Actually, like we said yesterday and the other day, the African countries, most of them do not have the regulations on digital trade. And Martina was telling me, yeah, we are here to find whether that is a restriction or not a restriction. You know, we may think lack, absence of the restriction is openness, but when it comes to the actual practice, you may be held back. You cannot enter that market. So we have to see how we defined it well, because we're saying in, in case of the absence of the regulation or a restriction, 
we score a zero and zero would mean openness. But now in the context of these African countries, it may not mean so. When the actual business comes, you might find barriers. So we, we, we should really look at that as OECD defines it like that at when there is, because really there was not any online restriction to most of these measures like transfer of data. So we cannot say there is no restriction, no. These countries maybe have to be helped to, to come up with the restrictions and we know the do's and don'ts. Yes, as far as Somalia is concerned, I would like to submit, those are the challenges I faced. I believe in the next session, I will be speaking about the technical needs of my country. I would be glad to speak about that in the same area of digital trade. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esther. I think if you can just switch off the mic, so it's for the people on, online. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think definitely you faced a lot of challenges and I'm sure it's not the case for all the countries, but they were very specific. So we are glad that you were able to uh, to share with us. And in fact, you are not there yet. So congratulations for what you have achieved so far. But Esther is actually working on the third phase. So in Africa, we are doing it by phases. The first phase, we covered 11 countries. The second phase, we covered 18 countries. And Esther is working on the third one that is ongoing now, where we cover an additional 13 countries. So by the end of next month, we will have covered 41 countries, including Somalia. Two things she mentions for uh, clarification for everyone, she talked about OECD. Uh, because in parallel, all our experts are collecting data, and I guess it is the same process in, in Asia and the Pacific and in, uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. They collect data for both. Um, the digital STRI uh, led by the OECD and the RDTII, which is what uh, Fandi presented to you in terms of the methodology. So Esther has finalized the work with uh, in relation to OECD on the digital STRI for Somalia, but the work on the RDTII is still ongoing, almost, but you're almost there. In a week or two, uh, we expect that uh, that you will be done. And she talked about mentors. Uh, I just want to share that. I don't know if that can be useful for, uh, for other regions, but what we have been doing is in the first phase, we were seeing that uh, it's, it's difficult for some of the experts to really find the information they need to be guided. Uh, so we have webinar session, training webinar, but that's not enough. And so what we have done in the second session, learning from that, we took, uh, some of the top experts of the first session, and we asked them to be to be mentoring the experts selected for the second session. And so they had more experimented people behind, not to do their work, but to help them, guiding them and answering any question that they have. And we have been doing the same for the third phase. So we pick experts from the second phase, we are mentoring the ones from the from the third phase, and then maybe Esther, Yasmin will be mentors for the fourth phase, or uh, we will see. Uh, but that, that's uh, that's a possibility. So we really want to build the capacity and make sure that uh, uh, what is learned can be shared and and that uh, it facilitates the work of uh, of over as well. With Ada, I don't know if you want to take over and, and bringing uh, an expert from Asia and the Pacific to also share uh, her or his views. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, I think many obstacles and challenge uh, that uh, Africa share is also uh, uh, quite similar in Asia. So I, I will uh, invite uh, Natnisha to, to share in the additional points or uh, you don't need to really repeat, but just add on. Um, hello, uh, I was involved in the data collection for Thailand uh, back in 2020 to the early of 2021. And in that period, it was like the pandemic time. So the country has imposed uh, some temporary measures, uh, some temporary restrictions. So we need to be like really careful that the time frame of the restrictions uh, or certain measures is uh, is short, so we need to add a remark when we uh, put in the data set. And um, 
I think like in Thailand, the country have several like digital trade regulation in place. So we don't have that much problem. And we also have the uh, data set provided by the government, uh, so-called Pistadika. The data set provide all the regulations from several ministry, but sometimes like uh, the notification or the supplementary law it is missing from the main data set. So I need to check on the uh, specific ministry website. And in the specific ministry website, sometimes it's a bit difficult to identify whether this regulation is still in force or not, or it has been revoked. So I found that uh, the secondary source, like the article online would be really helpful for me to check about, to make sure that uh, the data I'm looking at is correct or it is still enforced. And uh, lucky that I am a Thai, so I don't have any problem to access to the data, but I believe if the non-local researcher, they may find it a bit difficult because some notifications are not translated into English and it is really like complex for them to figure out the data. Uh, like especially the regulations in the government procurement or the telecommunication sector, uh, most of them are not in English yet, if not the act. So I think uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Nanisha. Uh, what I collect from, from Nanisha point uh, is, it is important or uh, at, at best is very useful if uh, national consultant is working with us in the project because many of the informations are in local language and are in unusual database that very difficult for, for the international researchers to, to dig into. So uh, partnership with local agencies would be very key successful going forward. Simon, I believe Africa would share something. Exactly. You know, thank you. Thank you so much, Natnicha, Nat for, uh, for sharing your experience. For us, sometimes we don't necessarily find someone locally, which was the case in Somalia. This is why we had to rely from a consultant from elsewhere in the continent. But we always try to prioritize, of course, uh, local one, especially when, when it's a challenge to get uh, uh, information due to to the language specificities we don't have we don't want to take much time but i think yasmin if you have any complementary information that you want to share yasmin had been covering egypt uh on the under the second phase of our project in uh, in africa Yes, um, for Egypt, um, the case was uh, uh, a little bit different than in other um, uh, African countries and can be similar to Northern African countries, perhaps. But for example, access to official gazette, while there is an online very good website uh, by the government that is covering all the legislations uh, it's like a very good inventory of the legislations of the country since ages. However, uh, um, it takes time to subscribe to it. And it, it's not mentioned, but I believe there is a, a security check that runs before they grant you access. So um, it's not uh, it, it's not it's not official. Uh, I don't have a, 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 a like a. Uh, proof for this, but uh, it could be the case. The only explanation why uh, it, it took so long so that I can have uh, have the access. The other uh, the other alter alternative is to go somewhere uh, and search in piles of hard copy uh, official gazettes, uh, which uh, which would still take uh, a lot of time, effort, and requires still that you provide why you need access to, to this. Um, although they don't ask for the online access, but they take your mobile number, you, you send message message from your mobile number, and you wait for them to answer back and subscribe. It takes a lot of time. The second thing is um, um, once you're in um, with a country like Egypt, uh, it, the legislations are a lot, um, amendments and reforms and 
are a lot as well. It takes a lot of time to double check that every single amendment of the law is not including anything related to digital trade, which takes a lot of time. So in some countries, I guess the timeline for delivery needs to be uh, discussed uh, with the mentors and with the reviewers. Uh, as much as possible, whenever the, the data collector starts thinking that it will take more time, um, it, it can be discussed and agreed and considered. Um, the, um, also with Egypt, um, for example, and I think with many other countries, the, the idea of the gap between what's in practice and what's in the law, um, and in, in I, I found this uh, a lot in, in some cases, a lot. Um, for example, um, in, uh, in the case of uh, sec security checks for, uh, for um, foreign companies before they register in Egypt or during, you, in Egypt, you can register as a foreign company, that's fine. Uh, but they tell you that you are subject to security check. You can start working, they don't stop you, but you can start working and you should wait for the security check to come uh, it can take years, it can come after 15 years, and when it comes and if you're refused, you, you, you have to just close down and go away. But the idea is that I couldn't find a law that proves it. I couldn't find it in the legislations whatsoever. However, it's a custom. It's, it's well known. I've I've, I was, I've established a, a, a foreign company once, um, and in Egypt, and I know it exists. So it, it took me a lot of time to find evidence for this, um, and I couldn't find a legislation. So also some, uh, I could find it in some of the countries, like the um, uh, developed countries reports about business practice uh, on the ground in, in Egypt, um, but I couldn't find an official document. So also, this needs to be considered. To what extent can we uh, accept reports by international organizations and which international organizations uh, or other uh, developed countries? Um, also, um, there is also a difference between, I believe, absence of legislation and absence of information about this legis legislation. And we need, uh, in my opinion, to think of how to differentiate when scoring. Because when, when we were checking Somalia, for example, yesterday, Esther, um, I could see, um, um, I checked the UNCTAD web website for legislation that are covered uh, for digital trade for Somalia. And we could see that three of them are highlighted as um, information not available. And one clearly mentioned no legislation. So there is a difference between to what extent I'm able to reach the information and the level of transparency of it. It could be there, but I cannot find it whatsoever. And between that really there is no legislation yet on this topic and we need to consider how to score this and that and this brings me to the idea of transparency which i believe should be also included in this in the index transparency of the legislation of the country on digital trade is important how can i know as a businessman coming from a different country how am i gonna deal with this country if I cannot access the information. So transparency, in my, I believe, should be one of a clear indicator uh, in, in, the, um, in this. Language, not for me. It was a barrier more for the reviewers. Um, I'm Egyptian, so I, I could access the laws. Most of them, all of them are in Arabic. Very rarely you could find translations, and most of them always mention that they are not official translations. However, um, it was very hard to find copies, uh, two things. It was very hard to find drafts of the legislations outside of the, uh, the official Gazette uh, website. Um, so the document is on this website. 
I have access to it because I have subscription. I cannot share my subscription with the reviewers. They cannot access it. And there is no other draft outside. So there is a trust relation here <laughs> that we need to establish. And the second thing uh, is that those legislations, most of them are not translated to English. So the idea of having a mentor who has um, the same language or the, the local language as well, I believe is very important because it will help as an as a intermediate step between the, uh, the, the data collector and the international expert reviewer uh, who needs uh, a second check uh, that is uh, accurate. Um, final a thing that I, I am just curious about for the future, uh, and it's the case of federal states. Because in some uh, federal states, some legislations are more to the, like, are more related to the, the this, the, are more issued by uh, states um, not, and not the at the federal level, like taxations and um, things like that. So how how do we deal with, with this, how, especially with taxation? It's one of the most important legislation related to this, and it's mostly at, at the local level. Thank you so much. No, thanks to you, Yasmin. I think those were very, very useful information. You went beyond uh, sharing experience. And you. So, so the first takeaway, I would say, is that uh, in your case, it was quite well documented with some caveats. But interestingly, you had regulated access to access regulation. So that, that's quite, uh, quite a challenge indeed. Uh, you also, I think, raised a good point about the methodology. Uh, at least in Africa, we need to reflect about that because it's true that there is a difference between absence of information and not being able to find it. Uh, so we, we need to, to think more about that. And then you, you gave us also a good number of, uh, of recommendations and uh, we'll take them on board, especially for the mentors. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, I guess we can, uh, I don't know, Rita, if you have anything to add, otherwise maybe we can move to the government uh, feedback. Uh, just, just to check, because I saw uh, our researchers also online, in case you have any any point you would like to add, uh, Juan and Kitish. Yeah, I saw Kitish hand. Hi, uh, good morning to you all from Nepal. I hope I am audible. Yes, we can hear you very well. Great. Um, I would like to thank SCAP and especially Vitada for inviting me to speak in this uh, round table. I had the privilege of compiling data for RDTII and OECD's DSTRI in 2021. Some of the challenges such as language issues, de jure versus de facto, lack of online versions of law, lack of codification of customs into a neat piece of law, and presence of subnational restrictions, uh, the challenges I also faced have already been mentioned. I would like to talk about a couple of challenges with regard to the data collection, drawing in particular from experiences in collecting the data for RDTII. While some provisions, such as whether a country is a signatory to certain international agreements and finding the scores in certain indices are straightforward and easy, decoding the absence or presence of regulations in certain sectors proved challenging. While the challenges I'm about to discuss emanate from the case of Nepal, I believe these challenges are also seen in several other countries. One of the biggest challenges that everyone here may already be familiar with is that there is no single legislation or regulation that governs digital trade. The, the regulations that have bearings on the digital trade are scattered around a large group of areas. This observation is kind of neatly summed up by the RDTII methodology with its different pillars encompassing different areas. Hence, the first challenge is to be able to devour a large body of laws and regulations scattered all over the place. Another challenge is somewhat related to the first challenge I mentioned. Some of the restrictions are not neatly encoded in a law or regulation governing this sector. One may have to really dig deeper into other government documents, such as circulars and directives or some sort of notices by the government. For instance, I was able to find some restrictions related to the telecommunication standards by pretty much devouring everything published in the website of the telecommunications regulator. Likewise, another challenge is when there is an absence of regulations in some particular areas, 
for instance, in the area of cross-border data transfer in Nepal. However, at first, you cannot be absolutely sure that some sort of laws or regulations do not exist. Hence, you have to grace through a large number of laws, such as privacy laws or other government documents and directives to see if there are certain provisions. Sometimes the restrictions may be found in sectoral policies, for instance, in financial sector regulations or health sector regulations that may restrict the flow of data. Likewise, another challenge is regarding lack of clarity on where to look. For instance, provisions such as restrictions on FTI, public procurement, intellectual property may be found under relevant legal provisions, but provisions concerning areas such as intermediary liability, data protection, data transfer may not be as easy to find given the lack of a neat legislation governing these areas. And sometimes it is not always clear whether a provision in the law is actually what you are looking for. For instance, there were certain provisions in the privacy laws regarding protection of data, but there was no clarity if it also covered the area of cross-border data transfer. Likewise, while there was consumer protection law, it was silent on the matter of online transactions. Excellent and prompt guidance by our instructors, Martina, Janus, and others was instrumental in resolving these dilemmas. Likewise, another challenge is regarding accessing proposed laws and regulations. The future laws regulations have no impact on the score, but may be critical in determining the regulatory landscape that is looming, or in other words, in deciphering what kind of future seems likely for the country in the area of digital trade policy regime. However, proposed laws and regulations are not always freely accessible. I would like to conclude my short intervention here and would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Kitish. That's very useful. Um, if if uh, no other researcher would like to speak, I think we can move to the feedback. Uh, we have experts and also government here with us. So I, I would uh, give the floor to, to expert first and then the government to join. Henry, you, you have something? Thank you, uh, Witada, and uh, thanks uh, for all the uh, 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 all the uh, experts uh, and the consultants who have worked on the project. I think uh, through your explanation, uh, I was able to understand uh, better the design uh, and uh, the background, uh, the challenges and the problems you face in the data collection, uh, which uh, were not readily available just from reading the report. So. Uh, I thank you very much and congratulate you on doing a very good job. Uh, now, um, I, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, synergy that could be created, uh, you know, by um, uh, uh, working together with the uh, other uh, databases uh, that are already existing, some of which was already mentioned, for example, the uh, OECD Digital Services Trade Restrictive Index, uh, uh, which I'm sure uh, you all have consulted in uh, your uh, work. So uh, going forward, I, I think it would be really useful, uh, you know, if there is a, a kind of a mechanism for uh, cooperation with the OECD and the other institutions, the WTO, the World Bank, uh, for example, have also been working on similar issues. So I think um, uh, this would be worth exploring. Uh, second, I I, uh, I understand that uh, the current uh, uh, framework uh, largely focus on the different uh, types of trade barriers, you know, as uh, found in domestic law. I was wondering whether we could take an alternative approach that is uh, by uh, looking at the corresponding provisions in uh, the chapters on e-commerce or digital trading free trade agreements and uh, uh, you know, use that uh, as a way to organize some of the restrictions. Uh, so um, uh, here, I think a good starting point uh, could be the uh, CPTPP, you know, uh, which is uh, really a kind of a model uh, for the e-commerce chapters. And here, uh, some of you might be aware 
uh, that uh, Mira uh, Buri uh, from University of Lucerne uh, in Switzerland has this uh, uh, database called the Taped uh, Trade Agreements Provisions on E-Commerce and Data, uh, which is uh, quite comprehensive. I think uh, she has like uh, 350 uh, free trade agreements. So uh, maybe you can uh, you know look into that and. Uh, use that as a benchmark. The reason why I'm raising this is because uh, I, I'm thinking of uh, the next step forward, you know, what do you uh, do next with this uh, really useful uh, index? I, I was hoping that it could form, uh, you know, the basis of uh, some sort of a best practice or handbook for policymakers to help them to uh, to really uh, guide, uh, you know, their legal reform or uh, revision efforts. And uh, in this regard, I, I also think that it would be useful to uh, maybe uh, focus on the uh, uh, on the regulations related to different players, because here uh, I'm trying to put myself, uh, you know, uh, in the head of uh, policymakers. You know, uh, if you look at how policies are made, they are typically not made by one single uh, ministry. You know, they are typically divided uh, between different um, agencies with different jurisdictions. So I was thinking that, um, you know, I, I discussed this in some of my papers where I basically divided all these different provisions into four categories of provisions, uh, some of which are similar to the one uh, already uh, in the uh, uh, database, but some of these are different. So the first category I use are the uh, common trade facilitation uh, measures. Uh, and this would include, uh, for example, provisions on uh, uh, reducing the tariff provisions on the uh, recognition of uh, electronic signature, electronic authentication measure. And uh, um, these, uh, I group them together and um, uh, because they basically uh, facilitate the trade for everyone, uh, for business, for consumers, and so on. But also because they typically fall under the jurisdiction of um, uh, one agency, that is the customers administration in most countries. So it is easier to look at this way. The, the second uh, category I have is uh, uh, the provisions which uh, uh, reduce the barriers for businesses, uh, uh, e-commerce business or digital trade firms. These include, for example, the provisions uh, that uh, uh, facilitate the free flow of data across the border, provisions against uh, uh, data localization requirements, and so on. So uh, these provisions, I put them together, and uh, that is largely because uh, these provisions uh, as far as I understand, are uh, typically in charge of uh, by uh, the Commerce Ministry and uh, in some countries, the Trade and Industry uh, Ministry, you know, so uh, I, I uh, that is why I group them together and also because they address the concerns of businesses, uh, you know, from the business perspective, what are the, uh, you know, most uh, useful features of all these regulations. The third category are provisions which are uh, designed to protect the uh, interests uh, of consumers. So these include, for example, provisions on privacy protection, uh, provisions on uh, online uh, um, uh, consumer protection, uh, and so on. And these provisions are grouped them together because they address the interests of the consumers, but also because uh, they are typically in charge of uh, 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 in the domestic uh, regulatory framework by the Personal Data Protection uh, uh, Bureau. Uh, you know, so uh, it is uh, good to to group them together. And here I noticed that uh, in the report, uh, actually you differentiate um, uh, domestic privacy protection and cross border privacy protection, uh, but Actually, in the regulatory framework of most countries, I would think that uh, the two actually come under the uh, one agency rather than two different agencies. So maybe it would be better to group them together. And the last category of provisions, which I summarize are provisions which are designed to uh, uh, provide some uh, policy space or regulatory autonomy for the government. Uh, so that they can deal with the issues such as uh, cybersecurity, such as uh, the uh, public policy, 
uh, exceptions, uh, measures, uh, uh, and so on. So these are typically dealt with uh, by the uh, agency uh, in charge of uh, uh, security, uh, telecommunications, and so on. And that is why I put them together. And uh, here, uh, I mean, uh, basically, um, the idea is that if you group them uh, and uh, these four categories, I think uh, it would be easier for the government uh, policymakers uh, to say, you know, so that they can divide up the task among different agencies so that one agency is in charge of, let's see, uh, you know, uh, removing the barrier for business and another agency in charge of, uh, you know, uh, protecting the interests of consumers and so on. So that would be easier. So uh, uh, I, I really think that uh, there should be a closer cooperation with the government. And I think that this could also help to solve some of the problems that uh, you you might encounter as some of you mentioned in the data collection because i myself also ran into the same problems when i'm doing some consulting work for uh, some UN agencies. So what I did, for example, was that I sent the draft to the government uh, so for them to basically to uh, rebut me, you know? So uh, because I couldn't find any information with the resources that I have, and uh, typically they would come back to me and tell me that, look, there is this uh, implementing rules, for example, which does include uh, this provision that you mentioned that said, uh, you said that didn't exist. Or we are in the process of making some new laws that would address this concern. So I I, uh, I don't know whether you know some of you might have shared the draft or whether you are allowed to share the draft with the government during the drafting of the report. But I find this process of uh, uh, you know back and forth with the government really useful because at the end of the day, I mean when we are doing this exercise, I I don't see uh, that we want to challenge the government. We want to help the government, right? I would think that that, uh, that is a purpose. So it's uh, better to involve the government earlier on in the process uh, so that they also, you know, uh, have uh, ownership in the report. And this would greatly help them, you know, in their, uh, uh, in their reform uh, efforts to, to improve their regulations. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Prof. Gao. I think that's very useful. Definitely, I think there is room for improvement uh, moving forward. We we took note of all the points that uh, that you made, and I think they are very valid. On the just a reaction on the government validation, I'm not sure how uh, Asia Pacific is doing, but for us, for example, in Africa. Uh, whatever is related to the digital STRI, we do a government validation. So we reach out to the governments. They organize themselves reaching out to different ministries, uh, authorities in charge of uh, telecommunication, and they give us feedback uh, so that then after we can publish, um, including on the on the OECD website, on the, on the simulator and colleagues of the OECD are online, and they will be also uh, showing the, the simulator later. We don't do it on the RDTII, so this is something we may want to think about, although it's a very heavy process already to get the information validated for the digital SRI, it takes time. Uh, you know, if they, the, the government doesn't necessarily have time to respond quickly, it's a lot of follow-up, but we get there. We manage to get there, but it takes a lot of time. So if we put on them the two databases that's very heavy. So we need to see how we can manage that so that indeed uh, there is some validation. But we are also providing, um, build, uh, developing country profiles, which summarize uh, the key findings of the work on both data sets. And we share that with the government. So if they have any feedback, they also share with us. And in many cases, as you said, they actually uh, told us that they were in the process of adopting uh, some of the of the laws or, or, or uh, coming up with with a law that we had missed uh, and so we put always a note saying that you know this is ongoing and so the idea is also to maintain uh, those data sets as we move forward and that's useful when we have to produce a new version uh, in the future because here we in the RDTRI we take stock on what has been happening so far. On the digital STRI, we work on a yearly ba yearly basis. So we we do from 2014 to 2022 yearly. Uh, we we do the the data collection. I don't know what that is. Yeah, for Asia Pacific, we we do have the consultation process with the government for RDTRI. So uh, we reach out to the government that we included in the database to, to have 
national focal points that would be the note for us in, in sharing the information and uh, share also within the countries. But uh, we, we do receive useful feedback on, on how accuracy is the data uh, is from the perspective of, of the country. Um, many countries send, send us the feedback. Some country also send suggestions on how they think the framework should be improved. So that would be, that is useful. And uh, this is also one of the reasons that why we have this meeting uh, to, to learn about how we could help further because we know that National Focal Points also face challenge in helping us verify the data. So what we can do it better in the next phase for closer collaborations from maybe even from the state of data collection, because if we can back and forth uh, to check, is this the data where, where we cannot find? And do you have idea of whether it exists or not? That would be also helpful from, from the very beginning. On top of that is the, of course, data verification process, which is also very important. And the update is also, really depends a lot on, on collaborations between us and agencies on, on the ground. Uh, I saw Katie. Uh, Kate, Katie is the chief of Next Trade, uh, CEO and founder of Next Trade Group. Katie, uh, do you have any suggestions to us? Well, thanks very much for having me. Um... And indeed, congratulations to everybody for this uh, excellent effort. Um, I think it's uh, really needed, obviously has been needed for years and I'm glad that the UN system as a whole has come together now and, and to support this uh, effort. It's, this is really critical and uh, of course, just the first uh, step in, in the work that we're doing. So um, we have actually done in my company uh, in partnership with USAID, with global technology companies, these kinds of exercises a number of times now we started, the first time we started to map out digital regulations. We wanted to understand how digital policies are working around the world to support SMEs in e-commerce. And we did that with about 45 uh, developing and emerging markets at the time and about 70 different digital policies, but also trade policies, trade facilitation policies, thinking that you know this is an index that would support governments in thinking about how to support SMEs in e-commerce. And we published that in 2018. And we did a similar thing um, a couple of years ago, again with USAID and a bunch of uh, tech companies uh, in this Alliance for E-Trade Development uh, that is a public private partnership just a couple of years ago. And we did um, 52 countries, a couple of benchmark countries like Singapore and UK, and then um, a number of uh, developing and emerging markets as well, uh, 52 altogether. And we mapped 100 policies um, in these different countries. And I know, by virtue of having done this, how very onerous and challenging the task is, particularly as you're dealing with different languages, apples and oranges, how the laws and policies are, are written and so forth. So this is a really Herculean task, what the team has uh, attained here. And it's, it's great to have. We've been very recently also working on what Henry mentioned um, on kind of understanding how countries are implementing uh, digital trade chapters or, or e-commerce chapters in trade agreements. We did this in CPTPP, looking at what are the rules and regulations and how countries are actually then implementing these rules. And we found that there is a bit of a, a in compliance, if you want, uh, involved there. And I think that's a useful exercise also going forward to support uh, countries in monitoring the implementation of their commitments in e-commerce chapters and agreements. And I think this is something for the UN system also to perhaps scale and consider, uh, just as we have done monitoring on countries' compliance with their RTA commitments, or we have the TPR process at the WTO, you know, this, this could be a, another useful path to, to go on and think about how countries are complying with their digital trade commitments. And then uh, the other thing that we have done is a, a kind of framework for a global technology company that everybody would uh, know uh, uh, on, on these digital policies from this company's perspective, which includes a little bit more of the flavor of what are AI regulations, what are cloud policies. And this company is now seeking to also do its own um, regulatory mapping as a result of this framework that we developed uh, just then. So 
So I think there's a lot of players involved and we've had some experience here. Based on the experience and based on my experience of presenting also these kinds of data to governments, uh, as well as working with private sector, just would have a couple of um, uh, suggestions and something that you probably have come across as you have also worked on this and other colleagues here have highlighted already. One is, of course, the, the relative importance of these roles, right? Uh, so a colleague was presenting first in the deck was uh, quite the, uh, quite the slides up. Uh, he was mentioning that some rules are more relevant than others for digital trade. And we kind of know that intuitively we can assess that uh, relative importance. But I think where we need to go is to start to show which is actually relevant. Now that we have the data on the independent variable, if you want, we can start to show which regulations actually matter to digital trade and things like SMEs, uh, cross-border e-commerce. So the, the measurement of the importance of these uh, variables will be very important, as well as kind of packages. You know, if countries have all these regulations in place and they all are great, is that they're more valuable than having a couple of good regulations in the important, so, so-called important areas and things like that. So th this is really the, the big, big challenge, I think, for all of us to, to measure this uh, going forward as well. The second is this keeping this up to date, right? As regulations change, like I mentioned, you know, private sector is thinking about things like cloud policy and AI policy and, you know, uh, things that affect, uh, say, machine learning, like machine readable data uh, that governments have uh, and things like that. And as, as this digital regulatory landscape evolves very quickly, and so I think something that we really want to, in this exercise, consider is how to keep this up to date and reflecting of the policy challenges that governments face and, and also the needs of the business sector, right? The, the uh, SMEs as well, uh, technology companies like fintechs and so forth, many of them are SMEs and then certain the global tech companies. So I think this kind of public private dialogue in designing and thinking about the frameworks will be, will be very useful um, to, to have to inform the development and evolution of this index. Because you might think that you know, in five years we are doing this together. Maybe some of us are here, maybe others are not. Um, we'll we'll probably be looking at a very different set of variables. Uh, some remain, but others have emerged uh, that we didn't even foresee today. Then the um, a couple of more thoughts I had on this was uh, the kind of relevance of of how do we understand the relevance of kind of regional coordination. All of us are probably advocating and talking a lot about convergence as how we need to reduce the regulatory fragmentation, right? And businesses, global companies certainly are interested in that because it would be much easier to operate around the world if the regulations were similar. Even if they were not optimal, it's almost better to have similar regulations than very dissimilar ones. And uh, I think we as kind of research community have yet to quite understand this uh, uh, kind of what is the, what should we be, uh, converging uh, on and uh, of course, how do we do that? It's another big challenge, but, but the kind of relevance of coordination on certain policy domain, how important is it to actually coordinate uh, policies on data privacy, for instance, is that really uh, uh, relevant at the end of the day for digital trade? I've been advocating that yes, yes, absolutely it is, but I don't think empirically we have the very, the most robust evidence yet, so we can work on that. Uh, the, the fourth um, comment on this, you know, as I've been showing these kinds of mappings and measurements, uh, also we've been doing indices and weighting and, and kind of, pro, you know, providing countries a sense of who has the most evolved frameworks and who, who doesn't, who is more lagging behind and what the, those that are lagging behind can learn from the more advanced ones. Um, you know, governments look at that oftentimes and they say, well, that's great. That's very useful. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'm happy that you've done that. And, we are now, by virtue of this, uh, able to see who is the benchmark in our region or sub-region or, or globally and uh, learn from that benchmark as to what they have done right and what we should do better. But I, I also have found that governments find it very helpful to learn about more of the case studies almost, about the substance of the, of the policy. Like, give me the, give me, you know, what are the best countries doing and give me the process as well by which they have arrived at this policy reform. So. You know, I may have in mind the greatest uh, data privacy law, the something that I want to push, but I don't know exactly how I get there or 
or internet intermediary liability, I think is another very good case where uh, governments are oftentimes wrestling with how they can actually uh, develop the internet intermediary liability laws. And you know, we've done some case studies, for instance, in Brazil, how they did this through a consultative process over three, four years. They established the safe harbor for, for um, uh, online um, intermediaries. And so, you know, and that was a very politically charged process, of course, a, you know, big democracy and very unruly uh, with the big media sector as well, very vocal. So, yeah, but, but those kinds of experiences, I think, coming from government officials that have gone and traveled through the reform path, um, for, for those that are in the beginning, I think are, are very useful. And this is what governments seem to be wanting. Like they, they've been asking me, uh, well, this is all very nice, but you know, give us cases, give us the reform path and things like that. And I can actually, if I find it, put it in the chat uh, here, a, a set of videos that we developed um, with USAID support to understand how, um, how different countries have start, done these uh, reforms and uh, have basically regulators talk about how they arrived at a certain FinTech reform, for instance, and so forth. So I think that would be super helpful, particularly for the US system to do, because you have, you know, you're global and you have experiences from around the world and, and things like that. And then the final is, you know, as all of us have, have, have alluded to, this is very painstaking, this collection of this data. And it's, it's just, uh, I, I haven't found that the language is necessarily that big of an impediment because we have now ability to translate, including on, on the, just the browser. So to me, that, that was not as big of a challenge as I anticipated going in. But, um, but certainly, you know, for us all to advocate kind of uh, machine readable data uh, and, and figure out ways in which we can keep all this data in real time, like that would be the right. The ideal would be that we're, we could just you know, uh, have the computer uh, uh, run, run this data in real time updated so that we don't have to have too many human beings at all in the process. Uh, as much as we love to look at this, um, we, we, would, uh, we would be able to keep this up to date on a real time basis. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a big thing that we all want to, want to work on. But in terms of like learning across indices, uh, that's very useful, I think, and connecting these indices is useful. Uh, at the same time, I think, you know, as I've seen, different stakeholders have different interests in, in constructing this. So tech companies want to understand how is the operating environment for them. Uh, you're seeking to educate governments about the good policy. So there's kind of, there are complementarities. I think it's, uh, you know, it's good to have a little bit of experimentation in this space and let every flower bloom. But obviously, you know, if you are as UN system plus OECD, um, maybe World Bank able to, you know, come together and, and create a more holistic approach. Uh, that's all very good and, and kind of complementary. Uh, so, you know, I would say it's it's good to, could you just let uh, innovation happen here as well in this space, but it's good to uh, then uh, also uh, seek some, you know, at least knowledge sharing in this space. So that's all on my part. And I, I'll figure out a way to send you these videos on best practices. Maybe that will be uh, exciting for, or, or useful for you. So thanks very much for having me and congratulations again. Many thanks, Katie, and very useful uh, ideas. Uh, if if you cannot share the, the video with us right now, please send me the email. I, I, I will take it forward. Thank you very much. Uh, should we go to by government? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and thank you, Katie. That was very insightful. And, and indeed, we look forward to, uh, to receive the video. You touch uh, also on a few points that I guess will come back on the next segment. Uh, you also did Prof Gao on the handbook for policymakers. I don't want to react to it because we are going to talk about the use of that information uh, in the next segment. Uh, but, but surely we can get feedback from government before we move into the, to the second segment. Uh, thank you very much. This, uh, I, I, I just would like to ask if the government uh, would like to say something right now about about uh, the, the framework and the methodologies, uh, technical issues. Okay. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Vitada. Uh, my name is uh, Gilaji. I'm uh, Director of International Cooperation from the Ministry of Commerce of Cambodia. Uh, actually, I uh, would like to thank uh, UNTAD for inviting me to this important workshop. 
and also thank uh, the, the ONTAP for engaging Cambodia uh, for this important exercise in terms of uh, reviewing uh, digital trade integration uh, framework. Uh, for Cambodia, uh, it's not really important for us as the focal point, but for our official involved in the process of reviewing as well. And uh, as per the uh, methodology, I think uh, because we don't have uh, multilateral uh, framework on digital trade or any plurilateral on digital trade. So it's hard to uh, coordinate within our uh, government authority. Uh, so uh, for us, uh, we try uh, to do it by case by case because uh, some uh, official in charge of the issues, uh, some they don't know the measures, they don't know uh, impact of the measures and they don't know how to uh, provide a substantial comments or suggestion to, uh, to, to, to the measures. And because of uh, this exercise, focus on tariff and trade defense, as well as you know, regulation or rules relevant to digital trade. So uh, for us as the government official, we have been uh, always careful you know, to provide our substantial comment or suggestion. As you have seen from the report, uh, some country are not a member of ITA or a member of a GPA or a member of Joint Statement uh, Initiative on e-commerce. So uh, we try uh, our best you know, to understand the issues, uh, to link with our uh, national uh, policy and strategy to make sure that uh, we can utilize this uh, index or tool uh, to uh, proper advise our uh, management or the government to you know, uh, participate in the uh, process of 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 uh, of the, the initiative uh, for us uh, i think uh, perhaps in the future in the next phase uh, building internal uh, capacity for government official uh, you know to uh, you know train them to enhance capacity uh, for them uh, on the on each of the issue so that they can provide uh, common or, or you know they can have a discussion with you know, uh, consultant or with the UNSCAP expert. In addition to that, I think uh, it should be very useful if you, or if the UNTAD or UNTAD Secretariat can uh, establish a kind of a guidebook on a digital trade regulatory review uh, so that, you know, the country can use it as the mechanism to uh, coordinate uh, with the uh, domestic industry. Because uh, I believe that all country uh, I'm uh, in this room, uh, in particular, a member of the WTO, and we have experience in uh, doing exercise on a trade policy review. Uh, but for the digital trade, I think uh, it's more than the multilateral trading system uh, in terms of the WTO TPR because uh, it involves with you know ITC goods, you know telecom sectors, or the government uh, procurement or uh, IP or uh, issues or other important issue that is uh, substantial to uh, the, the digital trade framework. Uh, what we want to see in the future is that uh, perhaps just my you know, uh, general observation or question to uh, Fundy or to the to UNSCAP uh, uh, Secretariat, if I may, on uh, this uh, methodology or the substantive issue, the 12 pillars that you put in place. Uh, is it quite complication when we have uh, the multi? I mean, I mean, plurilateral uh, agreement on uh, digital trade or e-commerce. When you know we start uh, doing this in early, an, uh, the the early stage, when you know the framework is not available, but we do our review uh, in advance. So I just you know ask you know uh, for your opinion. Or, or, or your thought regarding the implication on this uh, exercise. Of course, uh, for Cambodia, uh, we are supportive of this initiative. Uh, we work closely uh, with uh, Vertida uh, on, on the data collection, on data validation, and also uh, we organize uh, several meetings, even one by one in, in our country to support this initiative. And uh, in the report, if I also suggest not only presenting the, the fact that you know uh, this country or that country impose restrictive measures, but 
uh, instead of doing that, uh, perhaps uh, it, it might be useful for, for the Secretariat to uh, point it out that, you know, LDCs or uh, country are not really uh, have the uh, policies or regulation in place. You know, you should uh, have this top priority in your country to, you know, to, to make sure that uh, you can better integrate uh, itself uh, to 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 the digital trade integration in the future, because uh, as per the government perspective, we are in a position that we need to consider before uh, we join any international agreement, or we need to uh, build our internal capacity building in terms of trade, in terms of uh, utilize the trade, in terms of analyzing cost and benefit analysis of of joining that 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 uh, those agreement. And I think this is what I can, uh, you know, uh, provide the feedback right now. But we can have, you know, further uh, discussion. And I will be willing to talk to a secretary regarding, you know, some of the technical assistance or uh, capacity building uh, that we need uh, from our country. Thank you very much. Very much, Cambodia. Uh... Yes, about the, the priority of country, actually we have that, the country profile that identify gaps specific to each country. Uh, if you go back to Asia Pacific Digital Trade Regulatory Report that we released last year, uh, Nanisha, you can put in the chat. Uh, for Asia Pacific country, we have by country can, uh, profile. So you can take a look. Uh, for this one, the current publication, which we up great to the RDTI version two. We are in the process of preparing the country profile and it will be available on the data portal once we released. Yeah. But uh, meantime, you can look at the, the Asia Pacific version in, in uh, the publication that we prepared last year. Uh, Just, I mean, the, 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 um, you are a member of, of SCAP, but I think there are good takeaways that I take for Africa as well. I think, uh, and especially the capacity building uh, aspect, I think this is something that is important and we need to, to see how we could possibly go about it in Africa also. Um, I don't know if you want, uh, if there are other um, uh, governments that would want to take the floor or if you, or if we move to the second segment. I, I because the government uh, would have also the opportunity to to comment uh, on the segments of technical assistance needs uh, that we we are going to to move along. And actually, many many part uh, of the speech already mentions that as well. So we kind of in a in a in between one and two already. Uh, if you if you don't rest your hand at the moment, I would suggest we move to the second segments and then we oh, okay yes I, I just wanted to um uh, to have a, a small comment on on the idea of having like a digital regulatory uh guidebook um i i, th I think this is very complicated to reach now <laughs> uh but um my uh, my suggestion is that we have plurilateral negotiations that are ongoing in the WTO, or at least we have the GSI. So uh, no matter the, the, I mean, the political position of the country, uh, joining or not joining, that's absolutely fine. But the idea is um, that uh, Professor Henry also shared the, the the idea of like organizing a bit uh, perhaps the the methodology framework around some of the regional agreements but also we have we have a a, um, a negotiating text now for the for the GSI which is quite advanced so um what what can be done is to look at this negotiating text and find out, what's in there, look at the proposals that are, that are being submitted by the different countries. This will give you um, a, a good overview of the different positions and the kind of provisions that are being adopted. And um, once we have this, I mean, for the CPTPP, it's, uh, it's clear for the members who joined, uh, and it will be more clear with the help of 
uh, this exercise, the RDTI, how would they, uh, what is, how, how would they comply with uh, CTPPP or any other uh, um, possibility of uh, integra regional integration? But for uh, like that global benchmark, uh, while it's there on some of the elements, like uh, e-signature, we have the UN central model uh, um, e, um, model uh, laws. Uh, it's not there on some of the other uh, topics. So if we need guidance, I guess the best now to look at is to have, um, and, and I think you may have access to the WTO uh, website, is to look at what's going on in the negotiating text of the GSI for some guidance of the different approaches uh, in there. And this can also perhaps feed in some of the elements of the methodology, uh, uh, especially on data with the different approaches, for example, whether we have only uh, legitimate public policy uh, exceptions, uh, or we have legitimate public policy exceptions and security exceptions in the national legislation. This is this is uh, this is a difference. For example, this is an additional uh, uh, barrier. Um, thank you so much. I hope I was useful. Thank you. Thank thank you so much, uh, Yasmin. I think Fandi wants to to react uh, to to what you said. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that, that is a brilliant idea that I also put uh, in my notes that it's very important because the RDTI itself is evolving. Then we are, you know, like looking, uh, you know, like the relevance of this kind of uh, regional uh, digital trade integrations into the other kind of bilateral agreements or even bilateral agreements or, you know, digital partnership agreements that have been existing until now. So I think that's one of area that we are work, we can work uh, on together to find like, uh, you know, like what kind of measures that are lacking on, but also, you know, like uh, in the, I think in the other sections, we also discuss about, you know, like for example, the comparison between RTI and also the OECD, the STRI. And then we will talk about how they complement each other. And then maybe, you know, like instead of having RTI covering everything, but also maybe we can talk about how this RDTI can focus on something that we agree on uh, in regional, for example. And then the other two issues that I want to uh, tap on is about, you know, like uh, some of researchers talking about the lack of information due to the broken link or due to the, you know, like the lack of online transparency or absence of information, language barrier, or maybe just the complex regulation system. So it's so hard for the researcher to navigate the right regulations. Then uh, in the past, uh, the practice that we have, you know, like sometimes we end up finding no uh, official sources, but we find abundance of secondary resources, and it's and that's why it's very important to have this kind of government validations because during this kind of process, we can you know ask the government to help the researcher or to help us to find the right resources, or even sometimes they provide us with you know like the official documents instead of us you know the researcher going through the uh, finding the document by ourselves. So it's it can cut times and also you know help the uh, the process in the meantime. And uh, the third point is about the awareness. I think it's very important that some of you are talking about the awareness, not only for the government officials, because like, for example, in the case of Cambodia, the other government officials not really, you know, like coming to this room, they maybe not, don't know like about the ongoing uh, work on digital trade, but they're, you know, like the department is relevant for the digital trade. And that's why like, it's very important to building awareness to the government official beside the capacity, but also, you know, like when Katie talking about the awareness of the private sectors, because, you know, like uh, at the end of the, the users, of you know the 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 beneficial uh, the benefits of this digital trade will come to the uh, firms who are using the digital trade uh, for the uh, uh, operations and that's why like it's very important to also to engage them in the country uh, of this issue and then also it allows you know like the private sectors to have discussions with the government officials and then it will you know like, enhance and maybe we. Uh, uh, provide a new measures that can be considered under the RDTI. 
I think that's all for me, and then we can go to this next section. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Fandi. Uh, so indeed, let us move to the to the second segment. Uh, so I hope you don't mind. It's eleven thirty. It should not last more than one hour. Uh, we'll try to make sure we keep uh, with uh, with time. Uh, and so we move straight into the second segment. We we don't uh, take a break, so we make sure we uh, we finish within uh, within an hour. I also see a comment on the chat about the capacity building, and that is for us in Africa. And I think I, I'll take that comment later in the second segment because it's very much related to technical assistance needs that we are going to discuss now. So we are going to be now talking about the uses uh, of the information that we have been collecting, uh, what has been happening so far in terms of the use of it, what is planned, and, and suggestions from you uh, in terms of how we could be using it. We are going to talk about uh, technical assistance needs, and so we would welcome any uh, requests that you would have for us, whether it is at ESCAP, at uh, ECA, and even ECLAC, we can pass the message if there is anyone connected from Latin America and, uh, and the Caribbean region. Uh, and we'll also talk about possible expansion of the coverage of the countries uh, in, in each of the regions, uh, as well as, uh, as partnerships. And uh, Fandi, you talked about complementarity between the digital STI and, and the RDTI, and I think that's what we are going to start with, because our colleague from OECD or online, uh, uh, Javier, I think is with us, and it's very early for you. It must be uh, 5.30 a.m., no? Uh, so thank you so much for joining. You were here in addition from the beginning of the session. Uh, so over to you to... Uh, uh, present us the digital and STRI, and uh, uh, so you have about 10 minutes, I believe. So thank you very much. It is indeed a bit early, but uh, I must say it's been a really interesting discussion and really rich discussion. Um, and I think that it's sort of uh, a testament to the complementarities of the indicators. Um, what I want to do in this uh, short presentation is to run you through uh, what the Digital Services Trade Restrictiveness Index does. And uh, I don't want to uh, belabor the point of how we collect the data too much because we basically are very complementary and we have a very similar methodology, but maybe highlight a bit more the uses and try to think more carefully about uh, the next steps in this uh, process. So the Digital Services Trade Restrictiveness Index is essentially an evidence-based tool that identifies and catalogues barriers to digitally enabled services. We have on the one side a regulatory database, and then on the other side, a composite indicator. And the idea has been to provide this up-to-date evidence on digital trade policies and to enable analysis and inform policy discussions on, um, on things that are currently being uh, um, in the process of being discussed. We're, we're covering about 100 countries altogether, and we have two tools, and I will show you one of these, the STRI uh, Simulator and the STRI uh, Explorer. So what does it cover? Well, you said that the, the, the indicator, the DTRII has uh, 12 pillars. Well, we have five pillars. Uh, the first one is about infrastructure and connectivity. And in this area, we have issues related to things like interconnection, whether that's regulated or not. And importantly, things about cross-border data flows and data localization. On our second pillar, we have electronic transactions, where we put legal validity of these signatures or whether or not there are dispute settlement mechanisms. The third pillar covers uh, payment systems. And here we capture whether there's discriminatory access to payment settlement methods or things like restrictions on internet banking or insurance. And then we have a pillar on intellectual property rights or fourth pillar, which is about whether foreign firms are discriminated against on trademark protection or whether there is an enforcement of intellectual property rights. And then we have this sort of fifth pillar, which we're calling other barriers. And I, I think this goes to the point that Cathy and others made is that these are sort of where we start adding the other barriers that perhaps don't fall that neatly into the other categories and which perhaps might gain more prominence in the future. These are things like commercial or local presence requirements or uh, performance requirements. 
So the way we collect the data is exactly the same way that you've been discussing for the last couple of days. You know, we collect the laws and the regulations, we verify the data, and we check this against uh, countries, as was uh, said earlier by, by Simon in response to, to Henry's comment. Uh, we score, and then we add this sort of weighting mechanisms, which we do on the basis of expert consultation. And we have annual updates, new data in January every year. And our data goes from 2014 to 2020. 22, and we've just had our uh, latest uh, update. Now, expansion beyond uh, OECD plus countries has relied on very strong collaboration with uh, UNECA, UNESCAP, and UNECLAC. And so, just to say that we have uh, regular meetings, largely with uh, my colleague Janos Schwerink leading from our side, um, but this sort of uh, gives us ways of making sure that the indicators remain uh, complementary, but also that we learn from each other's experience in collecting the data. So what is it that the indicator is telling us? Well, largely we know that digital trade is global, but what we see from this image is that regulations are not. And so the digital STRI is very useful just to highlight the degree of, uh, let's call it digital fragmentation that is uh, currently taking place. So it allows us to, to provide a, a relatively interesting uh, snapshot of, of what's happening across different countries. Um, but also what we've been seeing by looking at the evolution of barriers to digital trade is that these are growing. And I'd like to just highlight the, the latest data point, which came in, as I said uh, earlier this year, is that from 2021 to 2022, we've actually seen a relatively strong increase in uh, barriers that affect uh, digital trade. The other aspect that I think is really important is the extent to which we are different regions and important to drive the message not just of where the regions are in terms of the height of the barrier but also in terms of the direction of travel so for example while we see that in OECD countries which is my diagram over here barriers are uh, lower um, the direction of travel is one where the barriers are actually increasing and while we see that in Africa the barriers are higher there we have seen that the barriers are heading towards a more generalized decrease and I think that that's an important point in the context of the discussions on digital trade that we're having internationally in trade agreements, but also at the WTO. So the way that we foresee policymakers to use this is via the STRI simulator. And I wanna show you what this ends up looking like. So I wanna choose, um, let me just choose a country. Let me choose Thailand, because we spoke about Thailand earlier. But essentially what we have here is a way of trying to access the data in a user-friendly way. So when I click on the country, we have Thailand, we have the digital STRI score, which is of 0 0.141, and we have our five categories of uh, barriers. And so when we click on infrastructure, for instance, we can start seeing all the different elements and we can see how they are coded over here, whether it's a zero or whether it's a one. And when we click on the regulation, when there's a one, we can actually identify the primary source of the regulation. So this is something that hopefully is a, a useful tool for uh, governments to understand where they currently are. But I think really importantly, what this simulator also allows you to do is to simulate what would happen if we would move to a different um, um, score. So if I go over here and I look at cross-border data flow transfers of data prohibited, and I click on yes, that would be a policy simulation of what would happen if Thailand would suddenly decide that they would prohibit uh, cross-border data flows. And so when we go up to the indicators here, what we end up seeing is that in these indicators, the uh, digital STRI score for Thailand would go from 0 0.141 to 0 0.402. So basically that that policy reform could have very strong impacts on uh, the, the, the score of the digital STRI on the restrictiveness that Thailand has with respect to uh, its digital trade policy stance. So I invite uh, uh, all of you to, to have a look at the digital STRI simulator. Um, it's accessible through, through Google uh, and hopefully it, it allows you to access the data in a, in a useful user-friendly uh, way. Now, the other way that we can use it, and this goes to a point that Katy made earlier, is to think about what is the impact of uh, these uh, regulations. And so what we've done here is that we've been 
uh, using a structural gravity model and adding the digital STRI to capture uh, barriers. So what I'm showing you here is what happens when we increase the DSTRI on exports of digitally deliverable services, other services, agriculture and food and ICT services. And what you can see, and the numbers are very big because they, they, they simulate a relatively large reform, but is that as we would expect, uh, digital STRI high scores affect uh, digitally deliverable services most. Um, the other element is also related to Cathy's point is, so what about the measures themselves? What, what, what do we learn from uh, which ones matter most? Well, we can also separate the digital STRI into its component elements on electronic transactions, infrastructure and connectivity, e-payments, other barriers, as I said earlier, and we can equally estimate the impact of increasing these with respect to uh, international trade. And so what we tend to find is that uh, an increase in the e-transaction component of the digital STRI tends to have a highest impact, then followed by infrastructure and connectivity, and then followed by, by other measures. And so let me just finalize by saying, what do we learn from this exercise? Well, I think the first thing is that we need to know where we are to know where we are going. Mapping regulation is extremely important, not just because we know, you know, where, where at the moment we, we are in terms of our policy stance, but also to understand where we want to go, also in the context of what was mentioned earlier by Cambodia in terms of whether or not we want to join, you know, the JSI discussions. We could not have done any of this without a little help from our friends. Um, so what I'd like to say is that digital STRI and the RDTII, well, that I think the collaboration ensures not only that the index covers more countries, which is what we've uh, been sort of relying on, on the UN um, regional offices for, but also that collaborations make our indicators stronger. It's by having these constant communications that we can ensure that we capture the aspects of digital trade that we think are important, which might differ according to different stakeholders, which is why also I would go to my next point, which is that diversity is the spice of life. These indicators that we have now are complementary and they cover different aspects of importance to different stakeholders and they help us progress. So the RDTII, for instance, has one thing that the uh, digital STRI does not have, which is that it covers the positive aspects of integration. So whether, for example, you are a member of the uh, ITA agreement, this is something that the digital STRI does not cover because it focuses more on the barriers themselves. But also, I think there's a diversity of indicators that's emerging. There's the digital policy alert run by Simon Evenet and Johannes Fritz, which covers different aspects too. And we ourselves have a, a second indicator, which is called the digital trade inventory. And so where the digital STRI covers domestic regulation, our digital trade inventory essentially covers uh, international discussions on certain issues. And it has an RTA component, which draws on the TAPIT database that Henry mentioned earlier, which is curated by Mira Burri. Um, and it also has a, a, a part which covers uh, international rules. That is, for example, some countries on the area of privacy in Africa might be part of the Malabo Convention. That belonging to the Malabo Convention might not appear on the DSTRI or on the RDTII, but it will appear in the Digital Trade Inventory. All of this to say that I don't think that there's one indicator to rule them all, provided that we are in constant discussions, we will be able to cover different aspects. And in that, I'd like to finalize with maybe uh, echoing one of the points that was made earlier. I think Henry made it, and I think it was made by the Cambodian delegate as well, that um, maybe the RDTII, one of the areas where it could progress uh, more and advance more is by providing that more regional focus that captures progress across different joint initiatives. For instance, we know that in ASEAN, there's a lot of progress that is being made on digital trade issues. The digital STRI is sort of on an MFN basis, so it doesn't cover that regional aspect. So maybe this is where the regional indicators can uh, provide more illuminating information. Uh, let me leave it at that, just to say that uh, it's been a, a really, a truly great process uh, to engage with the UN commissions on this. And, um, you know, I, I'm not saying that this has been something that we've just done in the past. I think this is something that has very long legs, and we look forward to continuing this really excellent uh, collaboration. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Javier. Um, we are also very grateful to OECD. Uh, first, we are pleased that you join us today. Uh, we really value the collaboration. It's the, you're a critical partner in this initiative, and uh, and and we hope that uh, we can we can continue that way, including on the next step to have a more regional focus, as you suggested. I think from what you, you presented, uh, very interesting to see the trend towards more barriers uh, to digital trade from the perspective of the digital uh, SCRI, at least. Uh, and I'm glad that you also presented the, the simulator, uh, which can be indeed handy for, uh, for policymakers and also uh, suggestions on how we can use uh, the information of the digital STRI for, uh, for analysis. So I think that that's quite important. Um, there is, I, I saw uh, a question, we don't see it here on the screen, but I saw a question coming up. Uh, so the idea is that we would take all the questions at the end, but I think this one is really for you and we want to release you if you need to leave uh, because we, we are really mindful that it's early and you, you definitely have other things to do. Uh, and there was a question about the weight. And the question that I saw was, what is the basis for the weights? Uh, you briefly uh, mentioned in the presentation, early in the presentation, that uh, it's uh, they are expert driven. Uh, but I think maybe if you want to come back on it and expl explain the process, that would be very useful. Yes, thank you very much. I think that's a very good question. And this is a question that uh, many have struggled with. Uh, let me just maybe take a step back. The, the digital STRI is based also on the STRI, which is a, a project that's been ongoing at the OECD for the last 10 years. And so the idea of the weighting structure is something that draws on the STRI process itself. Now, the way that it's currently done is through an iterative process in terms of trying to identify experts in the field and and trying to ask certain questions as to how much weight should be ascribed to each of the five different uh, pillars that we have. Uh, so in that sense, it sort of mimics what's been done in an RDTII. Um, but as it's asked here is, will these weights change? Well, I think that the weights can change and they have changed in the past. And the idea is that if we want to keep the indicator current, we need to make sure that we take into consideration new developments. So we regularly in the process of our digital STRI and our STRI have meetings with different stakeholders and with different experts. And if it is deemed that the weights need to change, then we will uh, effectively change them. The idea then is that then we can also apply these weights retrospectively if need be so that the indicator maintains its sort of harmonious, uh, uh, um, let's say um, it means it co its coherence uh, in time. So long story short is that we are open to changing the weights that if there are developments that require it, we will change them. But what I don't think we will do is change the method that we obtain the weights. Others have done in the past uh, estimations and have used uh, data to, to use uh, different weights. Um, the problem with that is that there's a sort of endogeneity because you can only observe a barrier when there is one. So using a, a, a data to, to do that, it makes it, makes it very difficult. Um, but yes, I hope that, that answers the question. Thank you so much, uh, Javier, for the for the clarification. I, I believe it does answer the, the question and uh, quite with a lot of uh, precision, in fact. Witada, is there anything you would want to add on uh, on Javier's presentation, or we move to the next? We move to the next one. So, Javier, again, thank you, thank you so much, and and we count on uh, OECD's uh, support as we are planning to cover uh, more countries, as you know. Uh, moving forward, so our greetings to to the colleagues who uh, couldn't join to today. Um, so next, we are going to talk about the use of the data. Uh, you know whether it is digital STRI, RDTI. What um, what are we doing with those? Um, I see the time. I was supposed to have a quick intervention to tell you what we do. Maybe I will just mention briefly what we are doing at ECA, then invite uh, some of our experts that are making use of the data so that you see the type of, uh, of work that they also do. And then maybe if we have also from Asia and the Pacific uh, colleagues who are using the data, we can bring them in. Um, and before we go to uh, 
the discussion around um, the increase of the coverage of the countries and the technical uh, technical assistance uh, needs. So at um, at ECA, um, what we what we have started doing it's um, we we are actually working with the European University Institute doing econometric analysis using that information both from digital STRI and the RDTII. And that's precisely to try to see if there is a need for convergence uh, across the countries in Africa in terms of regulations. And not everything, we cannot converge on everything. So what are the priorities, uh, areas that we can identify for convergence of regulation uh, within the, the continent? We are finalizing it, so it should be out in about a couple of weeks or so. Uh, and then we are also using that to feed into a broader assessment, which is a readiness assessment uh, in Africa to see where each of the country that we have covered so far is uh, to, to narrow down on the specificities for each country and hopefully to bring out also recommendations for the government in terms of where uh, in their own countries, based on what we have collected, we feel that uh, they could take on board possible recommendation to, to improve moving forward. We also have just received a couple of weeks ago a request from the AFCFTA Secretariat. So the AFCFTA Secretariat is the secretariat uh, that uh, uh, is in charge of the um, overseeing the, the negotiation and implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. And they have requested to us that we produce a study on the status of digital trade infrastructure in Africa. So this is complementary to regulation. That's the other uh, part of, of the digital trade. And that's what we are going to be also doing uh, in the coming months. And we will have case studies. So we will also work with specific countries uh, selected across the five sub-regions in Africa uh, to understand um, from a country perspective where they are with uh, digital trade infrastructure and what needs to be done uh, so that they can build, um, build the required infrastructure to take advantage of digital trade. Now, let me move to, uh, to Manfred. Uh, and Manfred has been working in, uh, has been involved in the initiative. He has been covering Congo. You heard Manfred two days ago where he uh, explained uh, what the results were showing for Congo. But Manfred is also uh, co-chair of uh, um, the WTO at the University of uh, Yaoundé 2 in Cameroon. And he is doing research and he has started making use of this information for his own research. And so briefly, Manfred, in not more than five minutes, if you can tell us what you have been doing so far and what you are planning to do using the, the information that have been collected through that initiative. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Simon, for giving me a float. So you have presented me. My name is Manfred Kuti. I am from Cameroon. So I uh, will not... Uh, repeat what has been done uh, very well by my African colleagues. I just want to talk about the use of the data I collected. As I'm a researcher, lecturer at the University of Amdutu, so I actually uh, may, uh, conclude my research title, Boosting the Intra-African Digital Trade in the AFCFTA Contest. Does regulatory framework matter, in which I try to show that uh, open and uh, organized regulation framework is an essential condition for boosting intra-African trade in the context of African continental free trade uh, area. I think uh, since yesterday, this workshop is very well for, helpful for me because I, I've learned more, learned more. So I've tried, I begin to write my paper. I use statistical data, but my big challenge now is to do a econometric analysis to show the, the contribution of each pillar, uh, how each pillar impacts the, the development of uh, intra-African digital trade. That's my big challenge now. I'm very happy that the data is quite available. So I think after this workshop, I will uh, begin to, to use uh, my econometry, to do my econometry analysis very, very well. So another point I try to say is that uh, uh, 
uh, we have to we plan to to to, to disseminate uh, the data in uh, the framework of our chair because you know that we have uh, many colleagues in the university that don't have this information is very important uh, to have this information to disseminate it so we plan to organize uh, a workshop with our master student because we have a master class uh, on international trade and economy diplomacy in our international relations institute of cameroon we also plan to invite policymaker to present the particular case of central africa uh, cameroon congo and uh, uh, republic democratic of congo so to inform uh, the policymaker and to inform the colleague to the advantage uh, to use uh, this data and to do a very good econometric analysis. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to be there and share it for you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Manfred. And uh, so I think you mentioned uh, a lot of things that are important, but I just wanted to come back on two. The first one is that, as you said, we are making this data publicly available and freely available. So this is something that uh, I think is important. Uh, the website for Africa is running already and you can access it. And we have built a joint uh, UN Regional Commission's platform uh, where you have, we will have all the information for, uh, for Africa, Asia and the Pacific, and also Latin America and the Caribbean countries. And it should be uh, deployed uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. Uh, the website is ready. And so we just have to, uh, to make sure we can deploy it as quickly as we can uh, from an IT uh, perspective. Then, and I think that's a good transition to our next speaker, it's you talk about your analysis and is already showing and you are going to go deeper into it now with uh, additional econometric uh, work that you are going to undertake. But I think the idea of boosting intra-African trade uh, in, in, and the importance of, uh, of enabling uh, regulation to digital trade is, is critical. Um, and in fact, um, at ECA, we work closely with the AFCFTA Secretariat. Uh, there is a nego negotiation that is ongoing on the digital trade protocol. And we hope that the information that we are collecting can be useful uh, to the negotiators and our member states as they identify key priorities uh, for the protocol and that they draft uh, and finalize the protocol on digital trade. We are also assisting, uh, as we can, the African Union Commission uh, who has uh, a, um, a digital transformation strategy um, up to 2030. And uh, there is a component in the strategy that looks at um, harmonizing uh, digital regulations. And here we are providing some input, but I don't want to take more because we have uh, Tapiwa with us. He is working at the African Union Commission. And Tapiwa also in not more than five minutes, if you can tell us a little what the AUC is doing in terms of uh, digital trade and, and uh, share your, your views. Uh, thank you very much, Simone, for that. Uh, I, I had maybe 30 minutes worth of information, but I'll try to <laughs> squeeze it out to, to, uh, to five minutes. I think I'll pick up from where you left and from where Manfred left, uh, which has to do with boosting intra-Africa trade. We have a program which was commissioned 2012, which is called the BIAT Action Plan, Boosting Inter-Africa Trade Action Plan. And uh, it gave birth to the AFCFTA um, uh, agreement. So the agreement, the action plan is almost 10 years old now, and we're looking to review the action plan. The action plan does not include anything to do with um, digital trade. So I think having the digital trade component within the enhanced BIAT framework will be a good thing to uh, to do. So that's number one. Of course, number two, you mentioned that um, the negotiators, the policymakers will make use of the data in as far as negotiating the AFCFTA protocol. Uh, digital, digital trade protocol. We have already um, some countries, for example, Malawi, uh, which is um, drafting its strategy, negotiating strategy. And uh, what the strategy 
basically does is to list what regulations a country the country has and um, where the gaps are and how it's going to you know going to the negotiating rounds um, so this data will actually will definitely be useful to 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 member states uh digital digital trade strategies from a national perspective to a regional perspective as well as to a continental perspective the data will provide information or will expose gaps in as far as regulation is concerned if we are able to identify where the gaps are at national level we are able to actually come up with the comprehensive strategy five year strategy how we're going to improve um infrastructure um telecoms regulations how we're going to improve data privacy in the next five years what reforms do we expect to improve um uh data digital digital economy development in the country at regional level we expect um uh, possibly uh, regional economic communities hypothetically speaking comesa can um, identify where the gaps are in as far as um how fragmented they are the regulations are and uh what they can encourage member states to do in as far as their regulations are concerned harmonizing their regulations harmonizing telecoms regulations data privacy regulations harmonizing electronic trans trans transactions and payments regulations um so as to ensure that there is um um, um interoperability of laws within the region and that will foster the development of e-commerce digital trade within that region and as you all know the regional economic communities are the basis for uh, the broader um, africa economic community um, the broader economic uh, integration at continental level at continental level uh, we have the african union e-commerce strategy of course it's something that has already been developed but it's a three-year strategy um 36 months because there's um uh, the evolution of um of digital technologies and we expect to improve on it uh, possibly in the uh, after 3 years and this data will actually become useful and i'm happy that uh, javier indicated that the date from the dstri perspective data is uh, updated annually and i'm hoping that uh, that will be the case as well for rdti i uh, that you know data is um, updated uh, so that you know it can be useful 3 years from now um, and you know um, member states regional economic communities and uh, african bodies can uh, make use of that so i think um, in short that's what i can say um, uh, compress in 5 minutes Thank you. Thank you very much, Tabio. No, definitely, I think the African Union Commission is uh, is uh, having a lot of initiatives on uh, in relation to digital trade. I'm not going to come back on all what you said, but I think you made a very good point that uh, uh, the BIAT Action Plan is uh, more than 10 years old now and needs an update, a review, and digital trade needs to come in uh, because it was not uh, considered uh, back then. Uh, I think you know the 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 fact that um, this data can be useful for national, regional, and continental uh, digital trade strategies. This is very uh, very important, um, and uh, and and we are happy to support the AUC as much as as we can, uh, as you know. Uh, so feel free also to use the data you need and 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 call upon us to to assist as uh, as required. Uh, something you didn't mention, and I think I should, uh, and uh, that's uh, uh, an initiative that is uh, uh, owned by three institutions, the African Union Commission, the African Development Bank, and the ECA. Uh, it was initially the Africa Regional Integration Index that we developed the three uh, of us together, and there is no digital trade component there. And so when we are building the RDTI, and we have in mind also to be able to bring the digital trade component into the index. It's not going to be ARI, 
uh, they are ongoing effort because now the uh, AUC has also developed AMRI, which is a regional indicators for the regional economic communities. And they are ongoing efforts to unify the two into one. Uh, so we still have a joint AFDB, AUC, ECA index, but only one. And that looks at both national, regional, and continental integration and where this data uh, can be used uh, to uh, to to provide the, the digital trade component of it, and just to to say because we are also going to talk about data coverage, but in the case of Africa, by the end of this year again, we plan to cover all the countries, and this is why we will also have the data uh, to to support uh, such initial initiative as we move forward. I think you made a good point also the need to update the RDTII. Uh, Katie said it, uh, you know, regulations, they change. And so if we want to stay up to date, we have to make sure that we produce new editions, probably improved ones based on the comments that we have received, uh, but that we do it as frequently as we can. I don't think we can promise we can do a yearly uh, index. That's too much to commit to, but at least that once in a while, the time is to be uh, determine we can produce um, uh, updated um, indicators for uh, digital trade integration. Um, with that, would you like to bring in then uh, colleagues from Asia and the Pacific to uh, share their, their views on the use of data, or even we can move on to uh, uh, coverage and, and technical assistance needs? Um, yeah, uh, I. I just would like to share from from our uh, experience because the the expert that used the data uh, unfortunately cannot join with us today. Uh, over the past two years, when we developed the RDTI, we have already worked with the pilot countries. Uh, so far, we have Pakistan and Philippines who we work deeply on using information on regulatory, uh, digital trade regulatory to feed into national action plans. So the studies are dedicated to Pakistan and, and Philippines already, already there and online. Uh, so that, that was the, the two case that we work directly with, with the government of, of the pilot countries. And then uh, from the secretariat side, we have actually uh, already established the digital and sustainable regional integration index with one of the components is coming from the RDTI. But we don't use RDTI as itself. We use regulatory similarity. I highlight uh, that uh, regulatory similarity index, which developed from the information of the RDTI database because the interoperability is the core part of regional integrations. So from SCAP point of view, we take a mapping of regulatory similarities and use that as part of the digital and sustainable regional integration index. And in fact, the information is already available in our online tools called regional integration analyzers. We have actually the booth to <laughs> live demonstrate on the uh, second floor in front of the meeting room. So you can you can look at uh, and, and play around with our two already. Uh, the screen is there. My uh, team will be uh, show live demonstrations before, uh, before the, the meeting start. Uh, also, we, we use the regulatory information in several research exercise with have uh, been in a process of doing econometric analysis to see how regulations on digital economies is affecting trade more broadly because digital economy is linking to trade, no matter it is digital trade or analog trade. So it is of our interest to see how digital rules would impact sectors that may be of interest of Bangladesh, of Cambodia, like textiles or uh, manufacturing, whether it's enhanced or is blocking, and if it is enhanced or blocking, which regulations is, is playing more roles. So uh, it's quite 
very much in line with the comments that we received from Katie and also the examples that uh, OECD uh, also mentioned. Uh, and we also going to have the, the publications, the flagship publication uh, late this year on digital trade and sustainable development with the, the chapters on digital trade policy will be draw very much upon on the information we developed in, in, in this initiative, the RDTII. So that, that is my, my short uh, interventions on this. I think uh, we, we would like to go around the, the, the room. I would like to hear uh, what the government would say about uh, how they could uh, utilize or how they would like our support on, 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 on this digital policy, digital trade policies areas. Anything to say? Okay. Uh, Mongolia, can you start please? Well, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, important event uh, that um, it gave me a more understanding about the uh, RTTII. Uh, unfortunately, Mongolia was not uh, covered in the uh, first uh, project, but uh, we would like to request SCAP include Mongolia as a pilot country in the next phase of RTTII. Uh, our, our country, Mongolia, is a landlocked country with a resource-rich economy, and the uh, our country shows a strong predominance of extractive industries uh, uh, in its economic and uh, export profile. Uh, and as in many countries around the world, um, uh, our Mo Mongolia trade has been heavily affected by the pandemic related restrictions, and as well as the current geopolitical events. Uh, economic diversification is a priority for our government, and it is supported by a strong focus on uh, developing digital economy, e-government, and e-commerce, which have been included in the long-term policy uh, papers, uh, as well as strategic documents of the government. Uh, we are aware that uh, digital uh, channels would provide opportunities uh, to Mongolia, where the geographical factor is a significant barrier to trade for uh, Mongolia's case. Uh, recently, ANCTA conducted an uh, e-trade readiness assessment of Mongolia, uh, in which uh, our ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, took uh, active participation and supported this uh, assessment. Uh, the vast territory and uh, uh, low population density, division between urban and rural areas uh, and uh, the um, have been uh, identified as uh, unique challenges uh, for my country in the development of the digital economy. Um, however, gaps in a uh, hard infrastructure uh, for the digital economy is being uh, progressively addressed. And at the same time, we also need to support to build a uh, soft infrastructure especially to have coherent regulatory frameworks and human capacity that are required for addressing new trade challenges. Um, Mongolia is a party to some key international uh, treaties, such as Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, Convention on uh, Jurisdiction and the Recognition and Enforcement of Judgments in Civil and Commercial Matters and the Convention on the Use of Electronic Communications in International Contracts. Also, uh, the Economic Partnership Agreement with uh, Japan, uh, it has a chapter on e-commerce. And uh, as for domestic uh, legislative uh, framework, uh, um, uh, we have a number of uh, rules and uh, laws regarding uh, certain aspects of electronic trans uh, transactions, consumer protection, privacy protection of trade secrets, cybersecurity, cybercrime, and open government data. So uh, we have a quite number of uh, uh, 
uh, domestic laws and regulations. However, these uh, legal frameworks are only partly based on international standards and are largely not implemented and sometimes contradictory. So uh, we consider that the initiative of ISCAP on digital trade regulation is very important and timely, and uh, we would like uh, to be really covered into the next phase of RDTI. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lao? Thank you very much to have me here. I am Mila Saibupa from the uh, Department of Trade Policy uh, in uh, uh, Lao PDI Ministry of Industry and Commerce. Um, actually, the, 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 the project start and, and I think we have coordinated with my colleagues which uh, from the different division, but uh, now the e-commerce uh, uh, responsible work have come to my division. Uh, and thank you to uh, help me here and, and have more understanding on the uh, work of the SCAP and the UN on the RTD uh, II. Um, uh, the point is that um, uh, as we now having uh, uh, the decree on e-commerce in Laos, but the thing is that uh, to look at the whole picture of the digital uh, uh, economy and um, the report also have shown me and enlightened me to to look into further areas, uh, not this, uh, not just in the area of from the uh, particular. Uh, let's just say, uh, right now we have the negotiation. I mean the the, the free trade area that cover the e-commerce and 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 many issues in there in the CSI in WTO and and, and in the. In said that ASEAN New Zealand upgrade, uh, even right now the uh, me myself is in the team of the uh, ASEAN uh, ASEAN China FTA that would like to upgrade in the e-commerce and also the ASEAN Canada that also everyone is look up into e-commerce and then and then and the thing is that uh, not in the Ministry of Commerce. Uh, itself can can do on the work we have to communicate and coordinate with the other uh line ministry and that is uh, a challenge and and to have this report and, and we have a, uh have more precise uh to to identify which area we are lacking behind or, 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 or uh, but just as uh other expert here that mentioned that even uh some area that we uh, a uh, score that is higher than average it doesn't mean that uh, it's good or bad. Uh, this is uh, depend on uh, the, 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 the intention of the government policy. Um, but also uh, some of the uh, policy that depend in the other ministry like the telecommunication, um, of course the extension uh, that we have the commitment under many uh, FTA or even the telecom annex in the WTO. Uh, I'm, when we was uh, implementing it, uh, the, the, the the telecommunication regulatory has established and then uh, to fulfill those commitments. And uh, but some may maybe uh, put up some restriction that we have a quite a high score and be uh, higher than the average. Uh, but uh, that could also uh, uh, indicate um, the intention to be uh, uh, have a quality telecommunication infrastructure in mind, uh, not to restrict the telecommunication or the uh, digital e or e-commerce e e itself. Um, so that's been, um, uh, in the case of LAPDR as LDC, we also need uh, the capacity capacity building in uh, many areas so that uh, those people can uh, uh, um, can be more aware that uh, which area we can improve and, and how can we improve uh, to be more uh, uh, digital trade integrated in, in, into the uh, uh, world economy. Um, and also, um, 
right now we uh, actually my team is uh, making a plan. Uh, next uh, Tuesday we're going to uh, call on of the line ministry to come together to, to um, uh, making a plan on how to implement that decree, uh, but not actually just not that e-commerce decree, but also work as well. And, and to have this report before my meeting is, is very much helpful because we can now have a more comprehensive uh, area that we can integrate into our uh, uh, plan of discussing. We are, we are planning also to uh, have a, uh, uh, establish a committee uh, from a mini life ministry to to come into uh, what we call is the uh, implementing um, committee of this decree of the e-commerce decree, and 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 they are now have many ideas and 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 also uh, uh, requests as well uh, as I have been um, uh, talked to some of them. Uh, uh, let's just say example like uh, the. Uh, ODA, the online dispute resolution, uh, which basically is in the Ministry of, uh, of Commerce and is in the Department of uh, Internal Trade. Uh, but uh, uh, this, to have this system work uh, as we want it, or uh, how to say, uh, to, to go smoothly, we need a lot of uh, capacity building on this. And, and they have mentioned that uh, okay, we do have to have a new regulation, the decision on this area, uh, set up the people, this uh, the, the the system, the hardware, the software, and anything. Uh, so the work is still a lot to be to be done. I mean, it is just particular uh, uh, area. So the other work is going to be more complicated. But the the thing is that. Um, to have as much people and and as uh, uh, as you mentioned that work together interoperability of 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 of, of these alignment industry together and to have this uh, uh, report to complement to our work is very 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 helpful and and, and I think we can uh, maybe uh, uh, in the work ahead uh, I would like to see is that. Uh, uh, how can this um, uh, study report can be further associate itself that um, um, we have the average index uh, score and 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 maybe some of my colleagues have mentioned well, what is the uh, uh, criteria or guideline that, 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 that we would like to see. But I also would like to see is that uh, not just the guideline that that come into particular um, recommendation, but I want to see that which guideline can be uh, make, make it more inclusive and sustainable for the people and in, in the, uh, I mean, uh, like LDC, uh, uh, Many uh, uh, trade negotiators we think uh, look into the market access uh, in particular, which means those big uh, country, uh, the most big company in the digital e-commerce e e area will much more benefit if we keep it. I mean, um, uh, keep the score as low as possible. I mean, uh, as I what if you're not if I'm not mistaken, but we have to also uh, thinking about that. Um, how can uh, we can nurture or, or, or let the people in in in, in the um, uh, in the LEC people, and I mean in the country like 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 mine, can be more beneficial? Uh, that is what I I can share my idea. Thank you. Thank you very much, and that is very useful. Uh, regarding the the guideline, uh, I think we. We can really uh, start by because we we have provided guideline on RDTI uh, version one with uh, we will share again the link and if you go to the guideline you will be able to see one by one 
indicators on the criteria and also the the logic of why uh, these indicators is should be draw attention from from the government why it is matter from from uh, that policy's point of view so and further uh, discussion uh, we will be willing to provide additional information with with uh, target um, line ministries or just reach out to us we can provide further information and we are very happy that the report is just in time for your meeting <laughs> we have the lao country brief that might be useful for for you to to see the overall pictures of gaps in in lao pda so we will share with you definitely uh, thank you very much Cambodia, you have already uh, talked. Yeah, you just still, want right? to emphasize again. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, actually, I just want to emphasize that, you know, the review report is very useful uh, for uh, the government as well as a relevant stakeholder involved because it sets as the evidence base where we can, you know, see uh, the gaps and see how we could, you know, bring up uh, to uh, the government as well as, you know, how could we uh, uh, consult with the uh, private sector uh, in, a, in an effective manner. And for the case of Cambodia, I think uh, internal capacity building uh, for our government official as well as the relevant stakeholder involved uh, should be in place uh, so that, you know, uh, people uh, dealing around the issue will understand, you know, how to deal with the issues. And more precisely, I think uh, to develop a strategy or toolkit for us, because you have the evidence, you have the, you know, collected uh, all the uh, data, information, rules and regulations. So uh, it's important to make it implementable, uh, which, you know, we set like action plan and the follow up plan that we uh, should do. Even this is not mandatory, but it's it should be useful uh, for the uh, government and relevant stakeholder to follow, you know, what should be done and what should be uh, the priority for the government to put in place, for example, like uh, policies or uh, rules and regulation uh, for the digital trade uh, integration. Because uh, like our colleague from Laos mentioned, it is not easy way for uh, LDC to integrate our economy into the net, uh, into the global uh, uh, digital trade. Uh, we have to uh, determine the priorities and you know set our plan ahead. And uh, what are the supporting mechanisms that should be in place uh, to to implement those uh, activity and. Uh, for us, I think uh, based on the report, based on the evidence that we have in the review, uh, the legal gaps remain. Uh, so uh, perhaps uh, it's important to identify development partner or maybe secretariat uh, can assist, you know, to uh, identify or to assist us in terms of uh, legal development or legislation adoption. So uh, that should be important. And uh, another important point that I want to bring up here is the uh, private-public partnership. Because at the end of the day, the government is not going to take the full benefit from digital trade. Only uh, the private sector, private st sector engagement, private sector involvement, and private sector understanding about the digital trade. And because trade, if we say in a simple term, imports and export if we you know focus on only the import export uh, will be imbalanced so we need to uh, train them you know how especially the smes the the sme the small uh, medium enterprise how can uh, they take benefit from uh, the the, reach, the 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 digital trade and uh, what are the supporting mechanism that uh, uh, should be uh, feasible to make sure that they understand the uh, the, the general rules on in, in in digital trade as well as the export procedures through uh, platform or through uh, digital trade uh, global value chain uh, that is the, the the most prominent one uh, for for LDC so uh, in short LDC are in the need of a system thank you very much thank you very much don't let it uh, thank you very much 
Bangladesh has always been a promoter of using digital technology in its every sphere of uh, every sphere, including uh, digital trade. In the recent years, there has been mentionable growth in digital trade uh, in Bangladesh, and small entrepreneurs are successfully using the platform. But digital trade has been happening in a discreet manner. Uh, so you know, now the government has established a digital trade cell in the Ministry of Commerce to facilitate digital trade in a fair manner. It should happen in a fair manner because uh, there are many op opportunities uh, of uh, defrauding uh, different things uh, in the digital platform. So uh, we also have a digital trade guideline. Bangladesh is committed to create a digital Bangladesh and the next edition of has already been declared by the government to establish a smart Bangladesh based on digital environment. So I believe such initiatives uh, will help the countries to transform it in the new uh, area of uh, digital environment. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I am uh, Do Quang Wei from the E-Commerce and Digital Economy Agency, Ministry of Industry and Trade of Vietnam. First of all, I really appreciate your effort on the methodology, the data collection, and also the workshop. You had completed a great work. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, this result, uh, the result of this research may help us uh, review our policy regulations and also in the comparison with other countries. But uh, from the data set of Vietnam, I think the data should be updated regularly. For example, Vietnam government issues decree number 52 on e-commerce in uh, 2013. It was amended and extended by decree number 85 in uh, 2021, effect from January 2022. Uh, the decree number 85 reduce compliance cost in some sub pillar but uh, increase in some other one. Uh, recently, Vietnam government focused on regulating the digital economy. Many new regu regulations were issued and took effect, such as uh, electronic identification and authentication, uh, personal income tax, uh, that affects seller on online marketplace. So in this, in this year, uh, uh, 2023, the new law on consumer protection and law on e-transaction may be passed. Uh, these new laws affect uh, digital check directly. So I think this uh, index will greatly change this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would would you be able to to share the specific uh, informations on that with with us? Will be very valuable on so so that uh, we can uh, further improve the the timely of the database. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. So that's why we have the, the national focal points to, to share with us the information and we would love to have this kind of feedback as well. Thank you. Uh, Tazikistan. Yeah, sure, thank you. We have an interesting saying in our language and it translates into English directly. If I translate, it says, if I'm not, if I won't say anything, I'm going to blow up, <laughs> right? So thank you very much again for the invitation. We have uh, we have made several strides in the digital trade area, especially recently we we adopted a new law on di digital trade. But uh, we would uh, like to seek or cooperate with ESCAP and other countries and other international organizations. In uh, first of all. 
basically in order to improve or to improve this whole infrastructure of digital trade in the Republic of Tajikistan. And first of all, I think uh, I would like to uh, seek support and propose uh, uh, to focus with the international community on developing the, method the methodological guide guidance on how to collect and analyze data related to digital trade right this could include guidance on survey design sampling techniques and uh, data analysis at the same time we would like to seek uh, uh, capacity building uh, for the government officials and the data collectors to effectively collect and analyze data on di digital trade the technical assistance could be offered in the type of training programs workshops and mentoring to help build the necessary skills and expertise. At the same time, we would like to seek uh, or attract uh, technology tools. Uh, the, con the collection and analysis of digital trade data can be greatly enhanced through the use of technology tools, technical assistance providers, or in the name of ESCAP and other international organizations could help us acquire or develop tools for data collection. Uh, such as data management software or uh, data visualization tools, right? And at the same time, we would like to co cooperate or collaborate with the international organizations, especially ESCAP on uh, data sharing and co collaboration. At the same time, we need to facilitate collaboration and data sharing between uh, different stakeholders involved in digital trade collection in Tajikistan. This could include building networks among government agencies, the private sector, and academic institutions to share data and expertise and to develop uh, common standards for data collection, right? And uh, by focusing on these areas of technical assistance, we could improve uh, our capacity to collect and analyze data on digital trade, which can inform policy decisions and support the growth of the country's digital economy. Especially right now, our government is uh, is putting a strong emphasis in the development of the digital economy in, or in Tajikistan and digital trade being a substantial part of this uh, digital economy. It can it, it can really have a strong impact on the economic development, creating new jobs and uh, and enhancing our export capacity of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, very useful. And I do agree indeed. Uh, talking about the data sharing, um, it, it is very important issue and become very, very challenging in, in digital era. And not only about the data on digital regulations, because colleagues in UNCAD who deal with the digital economy uh, flows and policies also come across the same challenge in, in getting uh, a proper measure, a proper data to reflect how uh, developed and how uh, challenging it is in each country, especially in, in Asia Pacific. Uh, there's still miss many countries in their database. And uh, with that, we have the presentation from UNCTAD that uh, they they would like to share some some thoughts on on data sharing and challenge. Please. My name is Daniel Kerr. Distinguished delegates. Greetings from the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development in Geneva. My name is Daniel Kerr, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk briefly about our work on measuring e-commerce and the digital economy. I will also highlight how the statistics we collect and compile from countries will provide a basis for analysis and international comparisons in the forthcoming Asia-Pacific Trade and Development Report, which will focus on unleashing digital trade and investment for sustainable development. ESCAP has kindly invited us to collaborate on that report, but we really need your help to make sure that as many of the countries in the region as possible can be represented. The first thing I wanted to make note of is the Handbook on Measuring Digital Trade, uh, which we're currently working hard to revise, and uh, the revised edition should be out in quarter one or quarter two of this year. It's a collaboration between the OECD, WTO, IMF and UNCTAD. And the handbook presents definitions and a conceptual framework for measuring digital trade, 
a reporting template for digital trade, compilation guidance on uh, producing statistics on digital trade, and many practical experiences, examples, and case studies from countries. So, as I mentioned, one of the main purposes of the handbook is to set out the definitions of digital trade. Um, so digital trade is defined as all international trade that is digitally ordered and or digitally delivered. And following from that, we have two subsidiary concepts. The first of those is digitally ordered trade, um, which is international trade transactions where the actual order is placed digitally, that is via e-commerce. Um, and we also have digitally delivered trade. So that's trade, international trade transactions where uh, the delivery happens remotely over computer networks. And as you can see in this uh, figure, those two concepts are not mutually exclusive. There is an overlap uh, between them where, for transactions that are both ordered digitally and digitally delivered. Now, I also just want to highlight the link to uh, e-commerce here. So the definition of digitally ordered trade is designed uh, to be aligned with the definition of e-commerce set up by the OECD for measurement purposes in 2009 and that way is also a subset of total e-commerce uh, transactions. Now another relevant framework I'd like to touch upon is the UNCTAD manual for the production of statistics on the digital economy which sets out a number of core indicators on the digital economy that were developed through the partnership on measuring ICT for development which brings together um, UNCTAD, the ITU, the OECD and various uh, other bodies including the UN regional commissions um, to agree on a list of key indicators for measuring the digital economy and those indicators were endorsed by countries through the UN statistical commission. Uh, the manual also gives guidance on how to compile those indicators and guidance on, on the presentation and dissemination of those indicators. So UNCTAD's core indicators on the digital economy are really anchored in a tiered working definition of the digital economy that was endorsed by the G20 Digital Economy Task Force in 2020. It's mainly focused on businesses as producers within the economy and identifies three scopes, core, narrow and broad. To delineate between those sc scopes, it really emphasizes the nature of three different things, that is products, um, which considers uh, the ICT goods and services and digital content and digitally delivered services. Um, production, um, so the extent of reliance on digital inputs in, in the productive activities of the firm and on transactions, whether those transactions are digitally ordered or digitally delivered, which is very much aligned with the framework used in the Handbook on Measuring Digital Trade. So to move on now to look at some of the indicators coming out of these frameworks, there are a number of core indicators um, related to measuring trade in digital products. And you can see here that I've presented trade in digitally deliverable services. So that is services that can be delivered remotely through computer networks. UNCTAD actually maintains databases on both digitally deliverable services and ICT services trade uh, using data that come from national statistical authorities by the UNCTAD WTO Common Services Trade Dataset. Digital production, there are several core indicators which focus on the ICT sector, and we at UNCTAD uh, compile a separate database of core indicators for the ICT sector. Um, the, those indicators, those statistics, they come from national statistical authorities, and we actually collect them directly through from countries through our core indicators collection. Through our core indicators collection, we also gather information from national statistical authorities in different countries on ICT usage in business. Um, and there are quite a few core indicators that come out of the ICT use in business surveys that underpin this. Um, so that seems like the proportion of businesses using computers, using the internet, with web presence, uh, and selling and buying online, among others. So what is done with these indicators once they're compiled? How are they used? Uh, well, the UNCTAD core indicators are a key source of evidence used in quite a variety of uh, analyses and products, including the E-Trade Readiness Assessments, which are likely to be of interest to this group. Um, 
national e-commerce strategies um, and UNCTAD digital economy reports, as well as being used by a variety of other organisations, including uh, the regional commissions. Um, they will also be a key input to the Asia Pacific Trade and Investment Report, or APTIR, in 2023 or 2024, and that will focus on unleashing digital trade and investment for sustainable development. But of course, for your country to be represented alongside the others, we really need your indicators to be submitted to our collection. So the UNCTAD database is of core indicators on ICT usage of business and the ICT sector are compiled from several different sources. For countries that participate in the European statistical system, we incorporate the data that they submit through Eurostat's annual collection processes. And we do the same for countries that participate in the OECD annual data collections. For other countries, we invite you to submit your indicators directly to UNCTAD. And we conduct this collection every two years. Um, and we actually have a new online collection system for 2023, which makes it easier to compile and track your, your submission of indicators. The notification or the invites uh, for that uh, submission are sent to the UNSD list of national nominated um, statistical contacts, which generally means heads of national statistical offices or senior personnel in those offices. Um, to the national missions here in Geneva and to previous submitters. So those are our, our working level contacts who have submitted data um, through the collection before. So it's fair to say that those invitations don't always get through the person they need to. And sometimes we don't receive responses. And in these several SCAP countries, we know have uh, and conduct business ICT surveys and have even published indicators, but have not participated in, our, in previous UNCTAD statistical collections. Now, UNCTAD will conduct an ad hoc collection for SCAP countries in April or, or May this year, um, with the aim that APTIR will be able to include both the latest data available for SCAP countries and indeed countries which have not previously participated in the UNCTAD collection. For other countries elsewhere, um, the collection will happen later in 2023, but we really need your help to reach those working on ICT statistics in your country, um, usually in the National Statistics Office, to participate in the data collection. So if you can help us with that uh, and put us in touch with them, please contact us at the uh, email emeasurement at unctad.org. Thank you very much for your attention and we greatly look forward to working with ESCAP and with uh, its constituent countries on the app tier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to the colleagues uh, from, from ESCAP. I think we have not been very good with the time. Apologies for that, but I believe we have covered uh, all what we wanted to discuss. Very briefly, to be comprehensive, uh, there is a co uh, uh, on the chat uh, a comment from uh, Aminu uh, Akadiri, who is the, the executive director um, of um, the uh, Africa Business Council. And he is also requesting, uh, which came up, uh, that we undertake capacity building, but not just for government, but also uh, for the private sector. So this is well taken. And I just wanted to very briefly give the floor to Esther, because Esther, you said you had a technical assistance request for Uganda. So very briefly, uh, please share with us so that we take good notes. Thank you, Simon, and everyone. Uh, Uganda's technical needs comes from the second database, the Regional in Digital Trade Integration Index. Uh, on uh, the technical standards applied on ICT goods and online services. Myself, I work with customs, I'm a customs officer. As much as I introduced myself as a, a, tech, a technical evaluation officer, but I work with customs. I'm involved in the day-to-day -day releasing of the containers. These containers bring all goods, including the ICT goods. However, when we finish to release these goods, one week down the road, this is now a practical thing. You'll find the import and you're asking, hey, have you sold the goods? It's like, no. The Uganda National Bureau of Standards is still holding my goods. So it brings us to this finding. This is a evidence-based the research that was conducted on Uganda, 
on regional digital trade integration index on self certification where they asked self certification not allowed for foreign businesses it's not only allowed for foreign businesses even for domestic businesses it's not allowed it's not only for foreign businesses uh, the, the result reads the Uganda National Bureau of Standards does all product testing, including of electronic equipment. Self certification is not accepted. The electrical testing laboratory carries out analysis of electrical products and appliances to assess their compliance with Uganda and the international standards. There are also fees charged for testing this equipment. Yes, it is not a law, but this is the practice. I believe it's because we do not have the capacity. You find that uh, we have limited laboratories and maybe staffing, you know, as customs release the consignments, you, uh, UNBS is supposed to check on the electronics to test the standards, but they are overwhelmed. For instance, customs was given technical assistance by Anktaj, where they gave us a software for self-declaration of goods. Initially, there was a very big challenge in this area, but when Anktaj came in, importers do self-declaration and the system checks. If there is nothing custom needs your goods for, the goods are automatically released by the system. So there is a call to give technical assistance to Uganda in this area of the technical standards. If a system can be developed, just like Ankita developed for us the system, you've been hearing them speak about, they get their surveys, their, their statistics from the national, from the countries. That is it true. As goods enter, Ankita has given us a system. We are busy capturing. So a system can also be de developed for the Uganda National Bureau of Standards so that when electronics come in, ICT goods come in, and the system checks, automatic check, and there is nothing, the standard is compliant, the goods can go. So there is a very big need, containers, containers are just there not being released because of capacity building. That's the technical need for Uganda and it's evidence based. It was captured here in the findings. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. So I have taken good note and we'll, uh, we'll take forward that, uh, that conversation on, on, on capacity building. I think we have not talked too much about partnerships, but we were hearing about partners who join. Uh, we just heard from ONCTAD, we heard from OECD and we'll continue the collaboration. Uh, we are from uh, from Next Trade, and I think Katie was saying that uh, you know she may be willing to collaborate moving forward. So this is also a partnership that we should we should uh, consider, and uh, the commissions. I think we should continue the work, uh, make sure we maintain the information, we cover the countries that have not been covered so far, and we assist as much as we can moving forward. So I'll just uh, thank everyone who, uh, who is here in the room. Uh, we join online um, our experts uh, from from Africa for the active uh, sure, active uh, um, participation. Uh, Tapiwa, Yasmin, Manfred, uh, Esther, Emmanuel also, and uh, you, uh, Witada, and Escap. And I think that would be it for me. Fandi, you want to add something, and then Witada, yeah. yes. last word for you. Right. Uh, just a, a little um, suggestions because we have heard about the technical assistance for the country that have been assessed by RDTI in terms of the in-house capacity and also the awareness and also the regional guidelines. But also, you know, like in Asia Pacific and maybe in Latin America, not all countries have participated to the RDTI assessment. And for those participated online here, then maybe you can, uh, maybe countries can consider to you know to join the RDTI assessment to look into the digital trade regulatory landscape and I believe the SCAP and uh, ECLAC will be happy to assist uh, this country to join the assessment.
Thank you very much, Randy. And, and uh, yes, I, I confirm that uh, SCAP is here and uh, willing to, to support uh, every country, especially country with special needs uh, in, in trade policies. And uh, for today, we talk about digital trade policies, but uh, we do cover uh, trade and industrial policy overall as well. So just reach out to us. Uh, you can write to, 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 to us and then we will take it forward. Uh, about the partnerships, just this morning, I got a good news that UNECE is strongly interested to come on board. So we almost covered the whole world already if, if that coming. Uh, but it will take some time, right? Because data collection is, is not easy. Yeah. Uh, with that, uh, I really thank uh, all the government who are with us and who are online, all the experts from Africa, from Asia, um, in room and online as well for uh, all Henry, especially that uh, come uh, together with us from, from day one until uh, today in this meeting. Um, we have very fruitful discussions and we have a lot of homeworks to think about further <laughs> to improve. So please uh, write to us if you have any more comments or any ideas that come up and you haven't told us today. So we will be happy to, to take it forward. Thank you very much. <laughs>